How's it going everyone? I'm Town Cape and today I'm going to give you my analysis on how the story, level design, gameplay, and art convey the narrative of Batman Arkham Knight and the rest of the Batman Arkham series. As always, I've converted my script into subtitles for this video, so if you want to watch this video with accurate subtitles, then please enable them down below. The Batman Arkham series is considered to be the best Batman and the best superhero video game series ever created. They've received praise not only for how they mechanically make the player feel like Batman, but also in how their narratives really bring Batman to life. However, their narratives can be quite divisive. Usually, there are two types of people when it comes to the Batman Arkham games narratives. Those who consider the first two games to have the best narrative, and those who consider the later two games to have earned that title. I'm of the former category, so I'd like to explain why I believe the narrative works better in the first two Batman Arkham games, rather than the later two. I'd also like to point out that the narrative is more than just a story, so I'd like to dissect how effective the other elements of the game are in pushing the narrative of each Batman Arkham game forward. Since the names in these games correspond to actual locations and characters within them, then I'll just explain how I'll be referring to them in this video. When I say Asylum, I'm referring to Batman Arkham Asylum the video game, but when I say Arkham Asylum, I'm referring to the fictional setting of the game. Similarly, when I say Knight, I'm referring to Batman Arkham Knight the video game, and when I say The Arkham Knight, I'm referring to the fictional character in the game. The footage used in this video doesn't belong to me and is from other YouTube channels. I've credited these channels on the top right hand corner of the video and I've included a link to a document with direct links to these channels in the description down below. The table of contents is about to go off screen now but it's also available in the description down below. This video will also contain spoilers from all four of the main Batman Arkham games, including their DLC. So if you haven't played them yet, then you may not want to watch this video. I don't think it's possible to talk about the opening of a Batman Arkham game without talking about the setting. The setting is one of the most underappreciated aspects of the series. The setting isn't supposed to be some generic video game environment. It has to be unique and just be great to look at. It needs to really pull you in and be a big part of the experience. Unfortunately, I don't think Knight accomplishes all of this, and thus it has a weaker opening. To understand why, let's take a look at the previous games. Rocksteady said that one of the games that influenced Asylum was Bioshock, another game with a strong setting. I think one of the most obvious ways that this influence can be seen in the game is with the opening. Asylum and Bioshock have very similar openings. There's little interactivity, and what little gameplay there is seems to blend in almost seamlessly with the cutscenes. Most of the opening is just about getting us to observe the great setting. While we begin traversing through Rapture or Arkham Asylum, we're only allowed to have a few inputs, despite there being such a strong environment. This helps build up anticipation in the player for when they can actually start playing the game. The player is seeing a great environment, and the game only allows them to have a few inputs, building up anticipation in them until they can finally have full control in traversing through the environment. I think this is a really effective way of doing an opening of a video game with a strong setting. Compare this with if the opening was just entirely a cutscene. That would require no player input, so the game wouldn't tease the player into building up anticipation for what is to come. Anyway, the primary difference between Bioshock's opening and Asylum's opening is that Asylum's opening involves more than just showing off Arkham Asylum. It also gives us a view of most of the main characters, the main villain, and even one of the bosses. So our expectations are built up from the start. We really get a preview of what we'll get to do as Batman in the game. I think this is a really powerful opening, and I was glad that it was reused for City. However, Origins abandoned this method and just resorted to a generic cutscene opening. I don't think that was the right decision on Warner Brothers' part. I think they should have done the opening the same way it was done in Asylum and City. What's worse is that Origins opening cutscene doesn't even focus on Origins setting of Gotham on the night of Christmas Eve. Instead, we just get a look at the Batcave, which isn't bad, but it's not where we're going to be spending most of our time in game. The opening cutscene of Origins just doesn't deliver the same level of satisfaction that the opening of Asylum and City did. But hey, Origins was just meant to be a tie-in game that was meant to come out in the long gap between City and Night. Surely when Night comes out, we're going to get that iconic Bioshock-inspired Batman Arkham opening again, right? Well, not really. 
We do get a low interactivity opening that blends cutscenes almost seamlessly into gameplay, but a few things are off. It isn't as strong as the opening scenes in Asylum and City. Why? Well, let's take a look. First, in this scene, we don't control Batman. We control some random GCPD officer. I don't understand this decision. A Batman Arkham game is supposed to make you feel like the Batman. In the previous games, the opening laid a strong foundation of what we could expect as Batman as we were playing with him from the start. However, when I'm playing as some random GCPD officer, I can pretty much expect that whatever he'll encounter to be insignificant and not something that's really going to add to the experience of being Batman. The second thing is that I don't think that this scare scene is done as well as it could have been. Zombie scares have gotten really cliche due to the amount of games in recent years that have used them. However, the popular use of them has taught us how to best make use of them. Games like The Walking Dead and The Last of Us have taught us that the terror we feel isn't really because the zombies look scary, but rather because we see terror strike the face of our characters. Good facial animations can make a huge difference to how we, as the player, can relate to our characters when they're overcome with fear. However, Rocksteady made the strange decision of having Knight's opening scene almost entirely in first person. Traditionally, the Batman Arkham games have always been third person games minus a few short scenes. However, the opening is now entirely in first person. In fact, Knight relies a fair bit on long first person scenes. I don't think this was the right decision. It's true that horror games like Amnesia have used first person before, but consider the context of these games. In games like Amnesia, you're mostly just playing as a blank slate with no identity. The fears you encounter in the game are your own fears rather than the specific fears of some preconceived character. This isn't the case at night. Despite spending a short amount of time with him, the GCPD officer is on a blank slate. He's given a bit of an identity. He's supposed to be on a diet and he doesn't want his wife to find out that he's not following it. So he's an everyday cop you would meet at a restaurant. The fears he encounters are supposed to be his own fears. So to really feel for him, we have to see his face. Simply hearing him scream isn't going to cut it. I think Rocksteady chose to have this scene in first person because they thought it would make it more engaging, but I don't think that it worked out as well as they may have wanted it to. The use of first person is something that I don't think was done that well in this game. The Joker scenes at the end of the game are supposed to show the smile being wiped off Joker's face as fear begins to overtake him. However, we barely get to see that because these scenes are mostly in first person. Fear is supposed to be a big theme of this game, so I really think third person should have been employed for all the scenes that involve fear. I think the scenes that did involve fear in third person were much better than their first person counterparts. The only first person scene that I think was fitting was the scene where Gordon discovers the new Jokers. However, I think that scene worked well because it was about surprise rather than fear. First person scenes seem to work very well when it comes to surprising players. Anyway, the third reason why I didn't like Knight's opening as much as Asylum Source Cities is because they didn't focus enough on setting. Asylum spent the first few minutes showing off what a great environment Arkham Asylum was. It took us room to room to show off the architecture. Same thing happened with City. I'm not sure how to explain it, but something as small as getting us to walk from room to room in the environment just made the entire setting feel all the more immersive. However, Knight restricts us to sit in one tiny little restaurant during the opening. Knight's setting is supposed to be the city of Gotham, so I would expect Knight's opening to at least take us down a few streets in Gotham. We don't get that by just sitting in a restaurant. A restaurant can't really represent a city. So from the start, Gotham as a setting just doesn't feel as strong as Arkham Asylum or Arkham City. Now let's talk about what makes a strong setting in a Batman Arkham game. I think the setting in a Batman Arkham game has to look unique but diverse and somehow add to the narrative of the game. Asylum and City fulfill these criteria really well, Origins and Night on the other hand had a few shortcomings. Arkham Asylum depicted a madhouse where madmen were supposed to be rehabilitated. Since most of the villains in Asylum were insane, having them set in a mental asylum complemented their characters very well. The external environment was also great to look at, because almost every building had a unique historically influenced architectural style. The medical building had Victorian architecture, the intensive treatment had an industrial look. Arkham Mansion had a gothic look, 
Maximum security was designed to look like a retrofitted bunker. The setting was unique, but diverse. Arkham City was designed to be a natural extension of the lessons learned from Arkham Asylum. Rehabilitating madman is impossible, so just lock them up in a restricted environment where they can do whatever they want. Similarly, each building in Arkham City was designed to represent the supervillain who owned it. The Joker's one was designed to look like a circus amusement park. Mr. Freeze's one was designed to be this cold room. Penguin's one was designed to be this high-class lounge. Two-Face's one was designed to be a courthouse. Hugo Strange's one was designed with an Art Deco style. Racious Wonderland had this ancient steampunk look. Once again, the setting was unique, but diverse. Origins was supposed to have a Christmas Gotham setting, but the problem was that it wasn't strong enough. The setting looked more like Gotham on a snowy night, rather than Gotham on the night of Christmas Eve. One of the biggest reasons for this is because despite it being Christmas Eve, there aren't enough Christmas decorations in Gotham, especially on the buildings. Most of them just have some ordinary lights decorated them, but that can be expected of any buildings during the snowy season. A lot more could have been done to give Gotham this creepy Christmas vibe. They could have had Santa Claus balloons or larger fancy lights decorating the buildings. My biggest complaint about Origin's setting is that it looks too normal. Blackgate Prison looks like any prison you would find in a video game. Penguin Ship looks like any ship you would find in a video game. The different interiors of the game aren't designed to look unique, the same way they were as in Asylum and City. It's not that easy to find a setting like Arkham Asylum or Arkham City in a video game, but it's not too hard to find a setting similar to the one in Origins. What makes this worse is that Origins recycles a number of locations from City, such as Sionis' steel mill. This isn't the best decision to make because reusing locations from a previous game is going to take away a fair bit from the uniqueness of the current game setting. I think this may be one of the reasons why we didn't see any of Arkham City within Gotham City at night. The setting of a Batman Arkham game really has to be unique to stand out. The only circumstance under which I think reusing a location from City would have been justified is if Warner Brothers added a unique twist to it. Like maybe if they added a creepy Christmas vibe to Sionis' steel mill. But nope, they just made it look like a regular steel mill. I've also noticed that a few of the gameplay scenes in Origins look strikingly similar to the gameplay scenes in City. That doesn't do Origins any favors in the originality department. Another complaint I have about the setting in Origins is that it doesn't seem to complement any of the villains other than the Joker. The creepy Christmas setting works really well with the Joker. Joker's a madman and he has a crazy way of spending Christmas. The amusement park in his hotel isn't just unique, but it's also something which complements his character really well. However, I can't really say the same thing about the other settings and the villains in it. I mean, how does Penguin Ship complement Deathstroke's character? How does Sionis' Steel Mill complement Copperhead's character? Above all this, let's not forget that the primary setting of Origins is the night of Christmas Eve. So the primary setting should be a creepy Christmas setting. But wait, how does a creepy Christmas setting complement Deathstroke's character or Copperhead's character? It made sense for a madman like Zast to be in Arkham Asylum. And it made sense for a power-hungry guy like Penguin to be in Arkham City. However, it doesn't seem to make thematic sense for villains like Deathstroke and Copperhead to be present in a creepy Christmas setting. The only villain it does really fit is the Joker. As for the Gotham City setting at night, I think it looks somewhat unique. The Art Deco buildings do have a gothic vibe. I also like how Rocksteady incorporated the stylistic elements of the animated series like airships and 60s cars in Gotham. However, Gotham still doesn't feel unique enough compared to Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Those two really look like places you just couldn't easily find in other video games. On the other hand, Gotham can be argued to look like an empty lost Santos in the night. Above all this, Gotham isn't diverse enough. Compare the interiors of Gotham with the interiors of the buildings in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. The interiors of Gotham mostly look too similar. They aren't diverse enough, so they don't capture your eyes as easily. Despite some stylistic adjustments, Gotham looks too much like a typical video game city that you can find in GTA. And that's why it doesn't look as great as Arkham Asylum, 
and Arkham City. I think Rocksteady may have had trouble making Gotham stand out because they didn't want to end up copying Arkham City. Arkham City was supposed to be a city being run by supervillains, and Gotham in Night is also supposed to be a city run by supervillains. However, the supervillains in Night have formed an alliance, so I think that idea could have been used to make Gotham look unique from Arkham City. In City, Rocksteady had different environments for areas under the control of different supervillains. Maybe in Night you could have had these environments blend in together. I just feel that it would have made more sense for Rocksteady to continue to build off from the unique external environment of Arkham City rather than to start from scratch and build a city that looks too similar to the typical video game city. Anyway, I don't think it's just the look of the external environment that contributes to a strong setting. I also think the look of the characters in the external environment helps contribute to the setting as well. I think the diverse enemy designs we got in City helped make it feel all the more memorable. Overall, there were five enemy factions in the game with their own unique design. Joker's Thugs, Two-Face's Thugs, Penguin's Thugs, the League of Assassins Ninjas, and Tiger's Security Guards. Each of them had a unique look, even Penguin's Thugs. If you examine them closely, you'll see that they have a penguin symbol on their bodies. Above all this, the, these different enemy factions were given their own personalities that they were given roughly equal opportunities to express. The League of Assassin Ninjas barely spoke, but that fit their personality. The Tiger Guards were always watching what Batman and the various incarcerated supervillain gangs were doing. The different supervillain gangs were involved in turf war disputes. So they were all doing their own thing. Compare this with Night. In Night, we spent most of our time with the Militia. It's true that there are still thugs that belong to Two-Face and the Penguin, but we barely encountered them in the main story. The only thugs we do get to spend a decent amount of time with are Harley's thugs, but it's still quite minimal compared to the amount of time we spend with the Militia. I know that there are side missions in which we can go and interact with different supervillain underlings, but in City, we didn't have to go looking for diversity. The diversity came to us. Since we're stuck with the same kind of thugs throughout most of the game, we don't get to experience diverse enemy designs. It just gets boring to see the same red militia thugs over and over and over again. However, that's not the only problem. The other problem is that there aren't any notable design differences in the different supervillain thugs with the exception of Harley's thugs. Harley's thugs have Joker's iconic cloud paint, but the other thugs, whether they work for Two-Face or the Penguin or whoever, look pretty much the same. Now to be fair, they aren't exactly the same. I think they have different symbols on the back of their clothes. Like Penguin thugs have this Penguin symbol on the back of their jackets. However, it's very inconspicuous. Unlike City, most of these distinguishing symbols are only located on the back, so you might not even see them for a good portion of the time. Honestly, I think using symbols to distinguish thugs isn't the best decision. Even in City, identifying the penguin symbol on penguin's thugs can be difficult, especially in free flow combat. What's easier to identify is if a good chunk of the enemy design is made to stand out like how Harley's thugs have a joker paint on them or how Two-Face's thugs in City had similar outfits to Two-Face. I don't know why Two-Face's thugs in Night don't have the same outfits they had in City. Those outfits look great. Anyway, I think I should talk about Night's narrative now. However, in order to judge how well Night conveys its narrative, I'm going to evaluate it in light of the narrative of the previous games. Since Night is meant to be the latest entry in the Batman Arkham series, I think it's fair to look at how well Night has worked as a continuation of the previous game's narratives. When I try to identify the primary theme of a narrative, I try to look for the idea that's uniting all the main components of the narrative. For video games, I usually don't take side missions into account because I think most of them are something extra thrown in after the main story is complete. I just focus on the main story. Basically, I try to identify the idea that is explored through the actions of the main heroes and villains. In the case of video games, I don't just focus on the cutscenes, but also take into account how the gameplay and environment may be contributing to the message. Using this criterion, I've evaluated Asylum's primary theme to be the choice of insanity. The primary message of Asylum is that curing insanity is folly because insanity is a decision rather than a condition. 
The idea of curing insanity is heavily criticized throughout the entire game. Not only is Arkham Asylum a failure, but all the audio tapes reveal that none of the doctors ever made any progress with their patients. Even at the game's conclusion, there's no optimistic future for Arkham Asylum. Sure, all the supervillains are back in their cages, but they're no closer to being rehabilitated than they were at the start of the game. Batman doesn't find any way to aid the asylum in its duty of rehabilitating the inmates. All he does is ensure that they're locked back up. Instead, Batman's story in Asylum is about how he isn't driven insane. Throughout the entire game, the supervillains try different means to drive Batman insane, but they all fail. Why doesn't Batman get driven to insanity? Well, because he chooses not to. The idea is symbolized best when Batman is injected with Titan. He's able to use his sheer willpower to resist transforming into an insane monster. The idea is also at work when we see Batman resist large amounts of Scarecrow's fear gas. Despite Scarecrow saying he's injected Batman enough times to drive 10 men insane. So what all this means is that when it comes down to it, insanity is a choice. If you really want to remain sane, you will, even after you experience all this crazy torture from different supervillains. On the other hand, if you lack the will to resist insanity, then there's no way you can avoid being intoxicated by it. This is why all the audio tapes of the supervillains we find in the game demonstrate that not a single step of progress was made in getting them rehabilitated. The supervillains just didn't want to be sane like Batman. They had chosen to become insane. The only effective cure for insanity is your own will, and if you don't want to become sane, then you won't. I think Rocksteady's writers tried really hard to weave this theme into the game as much as possible. All the main villains that we encounter in the game are suffering from some kind of mental illness. For example, Zass is a guy who had riches and a very stable life, but he threw it all away just to become a murderer. He's definitely insane. On the other hand, the saner villains of the Batman mythos, such as Penguin and Mr. Freeze, wouldn't fit into a story about insanity, so it only makes sense that they're absent from Asylum. I also believe that Titan is more than just a plot device. I think it was revealed in one of the tie-in comics that Titan was originally developed to help weaker patients cope with the more strenuous medical procedures. So it was originally designed to be a solution, but it ended up becoming a problem. I think that symbolizes the folly of Arkham Asylum very well, as Titan ends up turning people into the very thing that Arkham Asylum is trying to undo. Another thing I'd like to add is that Asylum's narrative has a level of subtlety that not even the narrative of City has. This subtlety is seen in the Joker's plan. Throughout the entire game, Joker tells Batman that he has something special planned for him at a party, but it's not ready yet and he still needs time to set it up. This is an important story detail about Asylum's narrative. The thugs in Asylum aren't really trying to kill Batman, or at least they're not supposed to. They're supposed to be trying to slow him down or capture him, so the Joker can have enough time to prepare his welcoming party for Batman. Harley says this herself. If he gets up, knock him down, but not too rough. Mr. J needs him at the party. So the question is, what is it that the Joker is planning for Batman? Unlike City, the Joker doesn't do any big plan reveals in the climax, and Batman doesn't have any epiphanies. However, the player can still figure out what the Joker's plan was if they examine the circumstantial evidence. The Joker calls Batman after Batman defeats Poison Ivy. When Batman arrives, the Joker reveals that he has Gordon hostage and he attempts to inject Gordon with Titan. That's it. That's the Joker's plan. That's the big surprise that Joker was preparing for Batman all along. What the Joker wanted to do was drive Batman insane by having Batman's closest friend turn into an insane hulking monster. Batman's relationship with Gordon is the primary difference between Batman and the insane supervillains in Asylum. It's his relationship with Gordon that reminds him that he's not on the same side as the insane supervillains. Joker hoped that by having Gordon turn into a Titan monster and having him attack Batman, he could drive Batman insane. Just examine all the events of the game from start to finish and this becomes obvious. At the start of the game, Joker has Harley capture Gordon. However, Joker hasn't reached his crates of Titan yet, so he can't inject Gordon dead. 
We know this because we didn't see the Joker inject any of his thugs with Tidin up till this point. The only Tidin thugs that we encounter up to this point were Tidin thugs who were presumably turned into Tidin thugs before the events of the game began. Then Batman rescues Gordon and has him leave Arkham Island on a boat. After that, the Joker reaches his crates of Titan. This is the first time we see the Joker inject his thugs with Titan. However, at this point, Gordon has escaped. So Joker can't hold his party for Batman just yet. He has to recapture Gordon, and that's why he doesn't call Batman until later on in the game. This is why at the end we see Gordon with two other GCPD officers who have been turned into Titan monsters. These two GCPD officers were the same ones that initially left with Gordon on the boat. The Joker captured all of them when he captured Gordon. Something else which supports this interpretation of Joker's plan is Scarecrow. When Batman is attempting to rescue Gordon, Scarecrow makes Batman hallucinate that he sees Gordon dead. Since Scarecrow is working under the Joker, then I think it's possible that the Joker may have instructed Scarecrow to give Batman that specific hallucination, because the Joker needed Gordon for his plans. At that point of the story, Joker hadn't even reached his tiny crates yet, so he couldn't afford to let Batman take Gordon away from him. So the Joker had Scarecrow trick Batman into thinking Gordon was dead, so he could stop Batman from tracking Gordon. The Joker's plan in Asylum really has a level of nuance that we don't even see in City. There are no big plan reveals. It's up to the player to examine the circumstantial evidence and figure out what the Joker is talking about. I really like something like this in a narrative of a Batman game. Batman is the world's greatest detective. A game about him should make my mind feel all analytical, whether it be through gameplay mechanics or narrative. Asylum may have had the weakest detective component in the series, but I think it more than makes up for it with the amount of detective work that's required to really understand what the Joker is trying to do in its story. The final thing I'd like to talk about is level design. I think in any game about insanity, the level design plays a huge role in how effective it is. Arkham Asylum is a great setting. It gives off this claustrophobic vibe you need when you feel like you're deep in thought. It's also the only game in the series to have these insane thugs that ambush you with their own crazy style. Running through a corridor in Arkham Asylum and being ambushed by one of them really epitomizes the struggle for sanity that this game is all about. I don't think Asylum could have worked as well if it had a more open world setting. The interesting thing about City's narrative is that I think it has two primary themes. The first one that I'd like to talk about is the deceit of death. Ever wondered why Batman doesn't kill his enemies? Well, City goes about answering this question. The way death is presented in City makes it look like a devil. Trusting death to solve your problems may look like an easy solution, but in almost all cases death is going to deceive you and everything is going to get worse. A deal with death is pretty much a deal with the devil. Death creates a false sense of security, and Batman knows this, and this is why he's very reluctant to trust death. So how do we see this in City? Well, we mostly see it in the main supervillains in City. I think the main supervillains of City were chosen to be darker reflections of Batman. Basically, they were all chosen to represent what Batman would be like if he decided to trust death to solve his problems. However, the way the narrative of City is structured proves that despite the variety of reasons people have for trusting death, death can almost never be trusted. Let's take a closer look at each of the supervillains now. Penguin is a guy who decided to use crimes, riches, and murder to avenge what happened to his family, rather than seeking a more just solution. He's designed to be a darker reflection of Bruce Wayne rather than Batman. That's why I think he's the only supervillain to make an appearance when Batman isn't even in his suit and is just Bruce Wayne. Anyway, Penguin's use of murder doesn't get him anywhere other than getting locked up in a museum, so the narrative is clear that having a tragic childhood doesn't justify the use of murder. Now let's talk about Two-Face. It's true that he only makes a brief appearance in the game, but his role still exemplifies the theme. See how the scene with Batman and Catwoman plays out? Two-Face shoots Batman and then becomes all complacent, thinking that Batman is dying and that he's safe. However, that actually isn't the case. 
Trusting murder causes Two-Face to become overconfident, and this is what allows Batman to capture him. It's interesting to note that at one point of the narrative, Batman himself is used to illustrate the deceit of death. But wait, Batman doesn't ever resort to death, does he? Well, not really, but there is a specific part of the game in which Batman does resort to death to solve a dilemma. That's when the Joker has his infected blood transfused into Batman. After that, Joker tells Batman that both of them would die unless Batman got the cure back from Freeze. However, Batman replies that he's satisfied with both of them dying. That's it. That's trusting death. Sure, Batman doesn't kill, but he thought that if he let himself and the Joker die, then it isn't really killing, and it wouldn't really be something that goes against everything he stands for, right? Well, actually, no. Batman is wrong to, tr to try and use an infective disease to finish off himself and the Joker. And the game depicts this by having the Joker immediately reveal that he has had his blood shipped to hospitals all over Gotham. This causes a huge shock for Batman, and this is a punishment for Batman. According to the morality of Batman, you should almost always avoid using death to solve your issues because if you do so, then you're going to get punished for it by having everything become worse. In this case, Batman tried to use death to solve an issue and he was punished for it. Anyway, then we have Rish and Mr. Freeze that are polar opposites when it comes to their justifications for death. Rish believes it's okay to kill your loved ones for the greater good, while Freeze believes that for the sake of your loved ones, murder is justified. Both of them are not too different from Batman. Rish wants to stop crime, and Freeze wants to save the life of his loved one. However, the game has us beat them up when they resort to murder, and that underlines how even for their reasons, murder isn't justified. Protocol 10 is also used to push the theme of the deceit of death further. Strange believes that if you don't kill criminals, then more criminals will pop up, and that's what he accuses Batman of doing at the end of the game. That's why he wants to eradicate all the inmates of Arkham City, but in the end, his entire plan ends up in disaster. The interesting thing about Protocol 10 is that it's used to build on Batman's no-kill policy by placing him in a unique situation. Batman can either save the life of his lover Talia and risk letting hundreds of inmates die, or he can save the lives of hundreds of inmates and risk losing the life of one of his loved ones. When he can't save everyone, Batman has to go with the option of saving the most people. That's why it makes sense for Alfred to force Batman into saving the inmates first. It was the best decision for Batman and it worked out well, because by the time he's done, Talia is still alive. If Batman had instead gone to Talia first, then he may have failed to save her and the hundreds of inmates who would have died to Protocol 10. Basically, the world of Batman is designed to punish those who resort to murder to solve their problems and it rewards those who don't. Murder may look like the best option, but it isn't. Whenever anyone resorts to murder, things only end up getting worse for them. Even at the end of the game after Rish stabs Strange, he gets all overconfident thinking that with Strange dead, he now has complete control over Protocol 10. Once again, death causes Rish to become overconfident. I think the deceit of death is an interesting theme to explore in a video game narrative because just the basic design of a Batman game will help communicate it. I mean, throughout the entire game, Batman, the guy who never kills, is defeating enemies who are attempting to use murder to achieve their goals. Each combat sequence is reinforcing the idea that those who use murder are going to lose. The deceit of death can also be used to explain the ending of the game. Why did Talia have to die? Why did Batman have to lose her? Well, it's because of Talia's own bad decision. Something I haven't seen discussed much is how the ending of City is designed to mirror the beginning of City. Remember what we saw at the beginning? A supervillain about identity was threatening to kill one of Batman's lovers. Batman's lover manages to get out and helps Batman to defeat the supervillain. Then Batman also manages to rescue the lover who the Joker attempts to snipe. What do we see at the end of the game? A supervillain about identity was threatening to kill one of Batman's lovers. The lover manages to get out and helps Batman to defeat the supervillain. Then Batman fails to rescue his lover from the Joker who attempts to snipe her and succeeds in sniping her. So why was the lover saved at the beginning and not at the end? 
What was the difference? It was their decision to kill. Catwoman doesn't attempt to kill Two-Face, she just kicks him. Talia, on the other hand, made a deliberate attempt to kill Clayface Joker, justifying it by saying that if she did it, then Batman wouldn't either. Killing the Joker makes Talia complacent, and some of her complacency even rubs off on Batman a little. Of course, Batman still realizes that death can't be trusted, so he soon realizes the Joker's trap. However, by then, it's too late. The Joker shoots Talia, and Talia dies. Something like that may not have happened if Talia refused to kill Clayface Joker and instead had apprehended him. That way, her and Batman would have still had their guards up. Then Talia may not have turned her back and it wouldn't have been as easy for the Joker to snipe her. Finally, let's talk about the Joker. With everything I've said about the deceit of death, it's obvious why this guy was killed off. If anyone uses murder to achieve their goals, it's this guy. Since the Joker is such a heartless serial killer, I think it's fitting that his death is slow and torturous, unlike other characters like Talia who get a quick death. When you think about it, you realize that the Joker did suffer a lot in City. I mean, he has all these doctors brought to him, but none of them can save him. He also coincidentally finds the Lazarus Pit at the end of the game, but it ends up being destroyed before he can use it. He also almost has the cure, but he loses it as well. What happens to the Joker is cruel, but I guess it's a fitting punishment for his consistent use of murder to achieve his goals. Anyway, now let's move on to the second primary theme of City. Despite City being all about how we shouldn't trust death, it does make an exception in which death can be trusted. This exception can be seen no better than in Ra's al Ghul. The world of Batman punishes people for trusting death to solve their problems, except Ra's. With Ra's, it's the opposite. The world is punishing him for not trusting death. Ra's tells Batman that constantly extending his life via the Lazarus Pit is causing him to lose his sanity. Thus, the best thing for Resh would be to just give up on living and die. However, why is the exception made for Resh? Under what circumstances is the trust of death warranted? I think the answer is the compromise of identity. If you can't stay true to who you really are, then you're going to turn it into a perversion of yourself that's going to wreak havoc. So if something is preventing you from being honest with yourself, then you should avoid it, even if it's a magical pit which extends your life. It's not worth compromising your identity for anything, even for a way to avoid death. That's why Ra's al Ghul becomes more and more like Solomon Grundy each time he comes out of the Lazarus Pit. You really should only live in a way that's true to yourself if you want to succeed with the goals you have in life. Ra's may have once been a noble person with noble goals, but constant use of the Lazarus Pit over the years has caused him to deviate away from his once noble cause. The compromise of identity is a theme which pops up in the game just as much as the deceit of death. Batman is punished when he compromises his no-kill policy. All the main villains can be argued to not just be versions of Batman who chose to trust death, but also versions of Batman that compromise their identities. A lot of them such as Two-Face, Clayface, and Ra's really have been perverted from the good man they once were. Even all of Strange's audio tapes have him interviewing the different supervillains about their identities. The only time the compromise of identity is portrayed in somewhat of a positive light is when it's used as a ruse to save another life. Both Batman and Talia use the compromise of identity in this manner. Batman pretends he wants to join the League so he can get Ra's blood and develop a cure for the Joker's disease that has infected him as well as hundreds of people in Gotham. Similarly, Talia pretends to grant Joker the position of leader of the League of Assassins in order to prevent him from killing Batman. Both Batman and Talia make it look like they're compromising their identities in order to save lives. However, they later turn around and reveal that they had no intention of compromising their identities, but they still end up achieving their goals of saving lives. The refusal to compromise one's identity is rewarded in the city. Even Catwoman's side story's ending is designed in this manner. If the player decides to allow Catwoman to leave Batman and escape Arkham City with her loot, then the game ends anticlimactically and you don't get to play the last few Catwoman missions. Why does the game punish the player for making this decision? 
because it's not something that Catwoman would do. If Catwoman saw Batman in danger, she would help him. Getting Catwoman not to do so is compromising her identity. That's why the game rewards the player for allowing Catwoman to make the decision that's consistent with her identity. If Catwoman saves Batman, the game goes on to deliver a satisfying ending as well as additional missions for both Batman and Catwoman alike. The compromise of identity is such a strong theme that it even appears in both the beginning and ending of the game. Both Two-Face and Clayface are people who have some good in them but ultimately let their identity get compromised and have to suffer a crushing defeat at the hands of Batman as a result. But it's not just them, there's another person who has compromised his identity more than anyone else. The Joker. The Joker allows Clayface to steal his identity throughout the entire game. Even in this audio tape, Strange notes how the Joker keeps inventing alternate versions of his past rather than telling the truth. The Joker ensures that pretty much each and every aspect of his identity has been compromised, so it's only fitting that the game ends with his downfall. I spoke earlier about how diverse the setting of City was with all the uniquely designed enemy factions and the distinct environments in which each faction resided in. I think it's a great design decision for Rocksteady to ensure that every faction in City had its own flair. It really helped to push the theme of identity further. It also makes sense for City to take a more open world approach to its level design than Asylum. If you really want to ensure that the themes of identity resonate, then you need a wide open world with a variety of inhabitants. Anyway, I can't praise City enough because I think it's one of the few games out there that took two big themes and explored them equally well. Usually when game narratives try to do more than one theme, they end up not giving each of them an equal amount of treatment. They tend to explore one theme more than the other. It's a very difficult balancing act to get the narrative as well designed as the ones in City. It didn't come as a surprise to me that neither Origins nor Knight's narrative surpassed Cities. They made a fine effort, but ultimately I believe a few shortcomings pulled their narratives back from how great they could have been. The funny thing about Origins narrative is that I can't figure out what the primary theme is. When I try to look for the main idea which underlines the actions of the main heroes and villains, I just don't see anything. Origins has a bunch of ideas but I have trouble identifying anything which I can call the main idea. I mean there are themes of teamwork and trust that we see with characters like Batman, Alfred and Gordon, but these themes have nothing to do with the supervillains. The eight assassins don't even work together. However, there is something that comes up with both the heroes and the villains, memory. I'm not sure if I would call memory a theme. It might just be a motive. However, memory does come up a number of times in the game. The Joker tells Harley that nothing is more cruel than memory. He then tells her this weird account in his memory. Bane is so desperate to capture Batman that he's willing to risk losing his memory in the process. Batman's epiphanies of how to save Alfred and Bane involve him using his memory to remember that he can make use of electrocutioner shock gloves to restart their hearts. But what's Origins trying to say about memory? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe it's trying to say that you shouldn't form your entire identity based on just a few memories. The Joker believes that he just wants to kill Batman but after experiencing Batman face to face and then remembering his first encounter with Batman, the Joker realizes it's just better to play around with Batman. I'm not really sure about this. I think whatever Origins wanted to say about memory, it could have done a better job at saying it. Its message, at least to me, just doesn't seem as clear cut as the message of Asylum, City or Night. There also seem to be other problems with the narrative design of Origins. I previously spoke about how all the main villains of Asylum and City were chosen because they helped push the themes of each game forward. They were all connected by a common idea. I don't think I can say the same thing about Origins. I don't see what common idea is uniting villains like the Joker, Deathstroke and Firefly. They're after Batman either because of money or because they just want to hurt him. Those are pretty shallow reasons for hunting Batman. It looks like Warner Brothers just took whatever supervillains look cool and hadn't appeared as much before and decided to insert them in Origins as the main supervillains. 
I have a similar issue with how the audio tapes were handled in Origins. While the audio tapes in Asylum were supposed to be about the folly of curing insanity, and the audio tapes in City were an examination of what made each supervillain who they were, the audio tapes in Origins seem to be about... Well, I'm not sure what they're about other than to just fill in story gaps. Now, I'm not saying that the audio tapes of Asylum and City didn't fill in story gaps, but they were more than just that. Above all this, the audio tapes of Asylum and City felt like realistic audio tapes. They were patient interview tapes from psychologists. They sounded like the kind of audio tapes you would find in a real-life mental asylum. In Origins, the audio tapes just feel like the audio tapes from Bioshock. I mean, we have characters recording what they're saying at random instances of time, even when recording themselves can endanger them. For example, in one of Joker's audio tapes, he's recording himself talking in his normal voice while he's impersonating Black Mask. Why would the Joker do that? If any of Black Mask's thugs see that tape, then they would realize that their boss is a fake. Similarly, we have corrupt police officers recording conversations in which they're doing shady things. Why would they record that? At least in Bioshock, we can afford to have some suspension of disbelief. Like, maybe recording yourself just got really popular in Colombia because people just started to feel lonely in the sky. However, the Batman Arkham games are set in a world not too different from ours. It makes little sense for corrupt officers to stop recording themselves while they're committing crimes. I know I've been negative about Origins, but I don't think it's got everything wrong. I think it did do a good job of depicting Batman at the beginning of his career. The Batman Arkham games tend to incorporate a fair bit of RPG elements, but there's one specific element that they've avoided using, the reliance on item pickups. In basically every RPG, after you defeat an enemy, the enemy drops an item and you pick it up and use it later on in the game. The Batman Arkham games were designed so Batman doesn't have to do that. Batman has items either delivered to him or stored somewhere for him to use later. He doesn't pick up items that his enemy dropped. Similarly, Batman recovers health by doing well in free flow combat. He doesn't pick up healing items that he finds. It makes sense why Rocksteady decided to have Batman not rely on items that don't belong to him. Because that isn't Batman. Batman is unique and independent. He has his own unique style and he doesn't need to rely on others. However, what about Batman at the beginning of his career? Would he be as independent as the Batman 10 years down the road? I don't think so. That's why I think Warner Brothers decided to have Batman rely a bit on item pickups in Origins. Origins is the only game in the series in which Batman doesn't exclusively use items he designs. Some of the items that Batman uses such as the remote claw and the shock gloves are items that he picks up from his defeated enemies. Some of these can be argued to be the first stage of items he uses in the later games. For example, the remote claw can be argued to be the proto line launcher as it has a similar function to it. So I think Origins does establish some continuity with later entries in the series, although I'm aware that Origins at the same time creates a number of continuity errors. Like why does Batman have crime reconstruction in Origins but not in Asylum or City? Harley's interview with the Joker in Origins is supposed to be her first interview with him. However, Harley's first interview with the Joker was given in an audio tape we can find in Asylum, and it presents a different account of her first meeting with Joker. The biggest continuity issue I think Origins creates is with Black Mask. In City, Black Mask's bio clearly states that he didn't get his name from just being a regular criminal who just wore a black mask. Sionis first fought Batman with a black mask, and the in-swing battle caused the black mask to be burned into his face. After that, Sionis was given the name Black Mask. However, the Sionis in Origins is already called Black Mask, despite the fact that his mask hasn't even burned into his face yet. Anyway, my main point is that primary theme aside, Origins has a bunch of narrative design issues. Its narrative just doesn't feel as well polished as the one in Asylum or City. That's why I consider it to be the weakest narrative in the entire series. 
Since we've taken a look at the narratives of all the previous Batman Arkham games, we can now evaluate the narrative of Night. I was hoping it would live up to the same standard as the narrative of Asylum or City. However, it ended up inheriting a few of the flaws that Origins had and even ended up having some unique problems of its own. Let's start with the primary theme of Night. What is it? Is it that we should trust our friends to help us even if it endangers them? Well, not really, but that's a part of it. The primary theme has to underline the actions of all the main heroes and villains, and I think the theme that does that at night is the control of fear. In order to understand what I'm talking about, let's take a look at what Scarecrow says over here. Once I understood your greatest fear, controlling you was simple. You blame yourself for her condition. You need to protect her, but buried deep down is the inevitability that you will one day fail. And that fear makes you mine. Scarecrow just explained the primary theme here. Fear can be used to control people. Once you have control of someone's fear, you can use it to force people to work under you even if they don't want to. This is how Scarecrow is able to control Gordon, or at least how he believes he's able to control Gordon. But Scarecrow is not the only character in which we see the control of fear. The control of fear can be seen in the Arkham Knight as well. The Arkham Knight is a man controlled by his fears. The horror and terror that the Joker inflicted on Jason allowed the Joker to have a lasting impression on him. Joker was able to brainwash him into wanting to kill Batman by taking advantage of the fear that Batman had abandoned Jason. This is also why I believe the Arkham Knight decided to team up with Scarecrow. He wanted Scarecrow to terrify Batman, the same way that the Arkham Knight as Jason Todd was terrified by the Joker when Batman failed to rescue him. That's something else I like about Knight's narrative. I like how it insightfully reworks characters to be about fear while still staying true to the core of what the character is supposed to be. In the previous games, the Joker was about insanity, but in this game he has been reworked to be more about fear than insanity. Turning into the Joker is Batman's greatest fear, and the Joker in him knows this and is taking advantage of this fear to gain more control of Batman. I mean sure the Joker hallucinations appear constantly around Batman, but they only really interfere when Batman is trying to do something when he's afraid. For example, when Batman fears that he may be too late to save Barbara, the Joker in him causes him to see two scarecrows. Similarly, when Batman is afraid that he hasn't seen the last of Joker after escaping Ace Chemicals, he ends up hallucinating seeing Alfred as the Joker. Basically, whenever Batman does become afraid, he either hallucinates seeing a person he's talking to as the Joker, or he hallucinates being surrounded by the Joker. Whenever Batman is afraid, the Joker is able to take control of more of his mind and body. So the Joker in Night is using the control of fear to dominate Batman. The control of fear is what Scarecrow's entire plan in Night revolves around. Similar to the Joker, Scarecrow wants to use Batman's fear to control him. He wants to make Batman afraid because he knows that seeing Batman afraid is the greatest fear of the people of Gotham and maybe even the rest of the world. If Scarecrow can make Batman afraid and broadcast it to the world, then he'll be able to make everyone else afraid as well. When everyone is afraid, Scarecrow will be able to take control of them. However, the control of fear isn't just something that's portrayed in a negative light. The control of fear can be positive when it's used by Batman. Both Scarecrow and Batman are enigmas of fear, and the entire game's narrative can be understood to be a struggle between the one who has the best control of fear. It's a struggle to become the master of fear. The primary difference between Batman and Scarecrow at the start of the game is that Batman is handicapped because a great fear for him has surfaced. If he doesn't find a cure for his Joker disease, then he'll end up turning into the Joker. This fear has frightened Batman so much that even Scarecrow notices that there is a change in his character after his first encounter with him. You might fool everyone else, but you can't fool me. Something needs to take you. You're afraid. You've always buried your fears. Lock them away 
lie deep in your subconscious and hidden. But something is gnawing away in the darkness of your mind, isn't it? Something even you can't control. The cracks are forming as it pushes its way to the surface. I can almost taste it. This fear only gets worse as Batman apparently sees allies like Barbara get killed because of him. So Batman is scared from the start of the game, and since he's scared, he can't become the master of fear. The master of fear shouldn't have any fears. If Batman has fears, then he can be controlled. And if he is controlled, then he can't become a master. Batman has to face his fears in order to become the master of fear. So Batman slowly learns to harness the control of fear as the game progresses. He slowly uses it more and more. He interrogates thugs by scaring them with physical pain. He gets Ivy to help him by taking advantage of her fear that all the plants in Gotham will die if she doesn't. However, Batman can't truly overcome the Arkham Knight, Joker, or Scarecrow until he can overcome his own fears. His own fears are holding him back, and he has to conquer them if he wants to succeed. As the game goes on, Batman gets more determined to face the Arkham Knight. After Batman finally defeats him, he accepts his role in his creation and thus faces his fears. Next, Batman has to face the Joker, who gains more control of Batman the more afraid Batman becomes. Batman tries to develop a cure to stop the Joker, but that ends up just being a waste of time. In the end, what stops the Joker isn't some medical drug. What stops the Joker is fear. Batman is finally able to regain full control of his body from the Joker when he chooses to use the Joker's fears to overpower him, when he chooses to use the Joker's fear to put the Joker under control. The cure for the Joker disease ends up being what Batman always had to be, an enigma of fear for criminals. Now with the Joker gone, Batman has no more fears. He has fully harnessed the control of fear, and he's now capable of stealing the title of Master of Fear from Scarecrow. Take a look at the climax of Night. It's quite symbolic when you think about it. Batman is freed by the Arkham Knight, a man who was once controlled by his fears, but broke free thanks to Batman. Batman then defeats Scarecrow, but he doesn't use physical strength or fancy gadgets to do it. He uses fear. When Batman is able to make an enigma of fear like Scarecrow afraid, he has truly claimed the title of Master of Fear. He has finally harnessed the control of fear. I think this is what the epilogue of Night is about. Those thugs see something that resemble what Scarecrow inflicted with Fear Toxin saw. What Scarecrow saw was Batman as the Master of Fear. Nothing scared Scarecrow more than that. I think the thugs believed they saw something similar. In other words, I don't think that scene was meant to be interpreted literally. I think by the end of night, Batman has truly become the master of fear. He has truly become an enigma of fear that can strike terror into the hearts of criminals unlike anything he's ever b been able to do before. So when the two thugs saw Batman on the rooftop, I think Batman was actually just dressed in his regular suit. However, now Batman is able to strike more terror into the hearts of criminals than ever before, as he's now the master of fear. So the criminals perceive Batman the same way that Scarecrow with fear toxins perceived Batman. In other words, Batman is now able to terrify criminals so much that without needing any fear toxin, he's able to make criminals view him the same way that Scarecrow with fear toxin viewed him. However, I don't think the Nightfall Protocol was the perfect ending. One of the biggest problems I have with Night is that it doesn't seem to want to give Batman enough genuine opportunities to conquer his fears. The only genuine opportunity I think Batman gets is to face Jason Todd. Other than that, there always seems to be some convenient plot device that helps him avoid the worst case scenario. To begin with, Batman never truly experiences the fear of his allies dying. Barbara doesn't die, Jason doesn't die, Gordon doesn't die, Robin doesn't die. I kind of wish Rocksteady would have really killed off Barbara. Additionally, I think the lack of ally deaths is the main reason why Rocksteady decided to have Ivy killed off. I was initially surprised that Rocksteady killed her off, because I just thought that was a very strange way to do her story at night. I mean, there were no hints in Asylum or City that Ivy was going to go down as a martyr. 
However, if we consider the fear that Batman has of his allies dying because of him, then Ivy's death does make a lot more sense. Basically, Ivy has been reworked into an ally of Batman in Night. She works with him for a significant portion of the game, and they both save each other on a few occasions. Then Rocksteady kills her off to bring one of Batman's fears to life, the fear of endangering his allies. However, the problem I have with Rocksteady rewriting Ivy as an ally of Batman is that it just feels like a cheap cop-out so they can avoid killing off one of Batman's real allies. Ivy's death just doesn't feel as powerful as Barbara's apparent death scene. I mean, Batman doesn't even seem to care that much when Ivy dies. This is quite unlike him when Barbara apparently dies. Compare these two scenes. Sir, what's happened? She's gone, Alfred. What do you mean? Barbara. Scarecrow was punishing me. He killed her. No. Oh, my. Well, sir, we need to focus. The people of Gotham need you. I should have protected her, Alfred. She's dead because of me. Sir? Sir, the gas cloud is dissipating. You did it. You and Poison Ivy, I mean. We underestimated the humanity that remains within her. She's gone, Alfred. Clearing the toxin took everything she had. Oh, I see. Her final act was a noble one. I need to find Scarecrow before anyone else dies. When Barbara apparently dies, Batman is really upset. We can see his melancholy in both his voice as well as his body language. When Ivy dies, Batman doesn't seem to deviate that much from his regular demeanor. He even opens up his video comp and speaks to Alfred the same way he does throughout the rest of the game. After Barbara's apparent death, Batman was too upset to even use the video comp. I know Ivy has mostly been a villain throughout her career and isn't as close to Batman as Barbara, but I still think Batman should have been more upset about her death. I mean, Batman was visibly upset about the Joker's death at the end of City. However, Batman wasn't even responsible for the Joker's death. However, for Ivy, he does bear some of the responsibility. He was the one who got her to help him. Scarecrow even said that he would make Ivy suffer for helping Batman. Dying. My tongue strikes at the minds of humans, but it leeches the life from her. Dr. Isley cannot stop me, but how noble you were to make her Gotham's first line of defense. So yeah, I don't think Ivy's death was handled as well as it could have been. It just didn't do justice to the idea of Batman facing the fear of losing his allies. Another fear which was totally avoided was the reveal of Batman's identity. This could have been done much better, but in the end it meant nothing because Batman seemingly faked his death and went into hiding. Having his identity exposed meant a lot for Batman. He has to face the fears of him and his allies being more at risk than ever before. Having Batman find ways to help him and his allies adjust to having their roles publicized would have been a great way of depicting Batman conquering his fears. However, Rocksteady is able to avoid all of this because they have Batman fake his death, which just feels like another cheap cop-out. I think the way Batman is continuously made to avoid facing his fears really takes away from the idea of him being someone who has conquered his fears and become the master of fear by the end of the game. What's even more disappointing is that this is the second time Rocksteady hasn't dealt with the threat of Batman's identity being revealed properly. The first time the threat of Batman's identity being revealed came up in City. Hugo Strange threatened Bruce Wayne at the start of the game that he would reveal his identity if he tried to stop Protocol 10. Even in the trailers, the threat of Batman's identity being exposed came up. However, in the actual game, Strange does nothing to reveal Wayne's identity. I mean, he has Tiger Guard stationed throughout Arkham City, and it's possible for them to spot a fully suited up Batman moving around since the start of the game. So despite spotting Batman from the start, and even in the climax of the game, Strange does nothing to reveal his identity. The whole threat of revealing Batman's identity just ends up being as empty in City as it is at night. 
Anyway, I also think that the control of fear could have been explored better. For example, Scarecrow assembles the supervillain alliance by using the control of fear. He tells them that if they don't pitch in to pay for the militia, then they may never defeat Batman. All the villains fear never defeating Batman, so they agree to help Scarecrow. However, I think that's a fairly generalized way of exploring the control of fear in regards to the supervillains. I don't think the fear of never defeating Batman is the greatest fear for many of the supervillains. Arkham City's audio tapes did a good job of showing us what the supervillains feared more than anything else. For Penguin, it's not living up to his legacy. For Two-Face, it's losing his half burned coin. I think it would have been better if Scarecrow had taken advantage of the specific fears that each supervillain had, rather than take advantage of a common fear. It would have allowed more of the supervillains to be integrated into the main story, and would open up better opportunities to develop them. The lack of integration of the supervillains in the main story is a narrative flaw that permeates throughout Night. I mean, this is supposed to be a supervillain alliance, but it, it doesn't feel like one. All the supervillains are off doing their own thing, and they don't even bother to turn up at the end of the game when Scarecrow finally captures Batman. Above all this, I think it's a bit strange that the supervillains all seem so scared of Scarecrow. Scarecrow is depending on them just as much as he's depending on himself. I don't see why characters like Penguin and Harley seem to be so afraid of disappointing him. It's just difficult to buy. What's even more difficult to buy is how much faith some villains like Penguin have in Scarecrow. When Penguin escapes Batman, he tells Batman that Scarecrow is going to finish him off. That doesn't sound like something Penguin would normally say. Strange said so himself that Penguin has a Napoleon complex, so it doesn't make sense for him to rely on others. Ideally, Penguin would like to do everything himself. I also think that a game which is so much about the control of fear should introduce at least a few more mechanics to actually make this theme feel interactive. Whenever the control of fear is presented in a night, it's almost always a cutscene. There's very little interaction, and I don't see why the levels had to be designed this way. One thing I always wanted in a Batman game was a fear infliction mechanic. Basically, Batman inflicts fears into his enemies based on how he defeats them. After that, he interrogates them for information and threatens to inflict more fear into them if they don't talk. But wait, Batman isn't the only person who inflicts fear into the thugs. The thugs' bosses do as well. It's obvious that Scarecrow has threatened all his thugs with fear toxin if they disobey orders by doing things like divulging information to Batman. So in order for Batman to get the necessary information out of a thug, he has to make the thug more afraid of Batman than he is of Scarecrow. So Batman has to attack the thug in a way that inflicts as much fear as possible into the thug's heart. The thug will finally talk when Batman has made him more afraid of him than he is of Scarecrow. So Batman has to inflict enough fear into the thug's heart that the thug's level of fear of Batman surpasses his level of fear of Scarecrow. I think this would be an interesting mechanic to introduce in a Batman game, because it would add another layer of strategy to combat. Players would have to try harder to really play as enigmas of fear if they want to collect information to advance the story. They might also have to make a choice on who they want to take down. This thug might not fear Scarecrow, so you won't have to scare him as much to get him to talk. However, he'll be more difficult to take down as he's a tough opponent. Similarly, another thug will fear Scarecrow more, so he'll be more difficult to extract information from. However, he's weak and is easy to take down, so if you're low on health, then it may be worthwhile to consider preying on him. There are also a few logical inconsistencies in Knight's narrative, and a few of them come down to not the best design decisions. I'll speak about one of them when I talk about the art, but there is another one which I'd like to mention here. Knight upgrades Batman's comm link into a video comm. Now Batman doesn't just talk to Alfred or Oracle over the radio, he communicates with them over video. It seems like a welcome addition to the series, until you consider what implications a video comm has on the narrative. Batman has to keep his identity a secret. One of the reasons why the Arkham Knight is supposed to be so intimidating is because he knows personal details about Batman, such as Batman's identity, 
and the fact that Barbara Gordon works for him. This is supposed to be top secret information that's supposed to be well hidden. However, the video com compromises all of this. Just think about it, the militia have troops including choppers and aerial drones deployed all over Gotham. They might even be recording things. However, Batman is still able to go around with the video com and not have his identity compromised or his allies put at risk. That's difficult to believe. I mean, at the start of the game, after Batman breaks the thug's arm, he opens up his video cop to talk to Barbara. That's what actually happens. He opens up a video chat with Barbara Gordon right next to a militia thug who's working for Scarecrow. If Batman is going to do something like that, then why is he surprised when Scarecrow manages to figure out that Barbara is working for him and kidnaps her? I mean, it's not like Barbara isn't the daughter of a famous police commissioner who's a strong candidate for the next mayor of Gotham. I know the militia is a foreign militia and not all of them will be familiar with the people of Gotham, but if this thug just went to Scarecrow and told him that he saw Batman talking to some red-haired, bespectacled girl over video chat, then it wouldn't be difficult for Scarecrow to deduce that the red-haired, bespectacled girl is the daughter of Commissioner Gordon. Similarly, Batman also uses his video call to talk to Alfred and Lucius after Barbara is abducted. If any of the thugs see Batman talking to Alfred, the butler of Bruce Wayne, and Lucius, the CEO of Wayne Enterprises, then it'll be easy to figure out that Batman is Bruce Wayne. Lucius also makes the big mistake of always referring to Batman as Mr. Wayne. At least Alfred only refers to him as Sir. Anyway, I think a regular comic similar to the one in Asylum City and Origins would have avoided all these issues. As there's no visual ID, nobody will be able to tell which Alfred or Lucius Batman is talking to. Those are unique names and there can be heaps of people in and outside of Gotham with those names. Now I know this is a comic book game and things aren't always meant to be logical. There does have to be some leaps in logic. However, I think an effective narrative should only do illogical things if it gives more than it takes away. For example, the grappling gun allows Batman to be pulled from one building to the next. In the real world, something like this is practically impossible, but it does make for a great gameplay experience. The pros outweigh the cons, so it's a welcome addition to the game. However, I don't think the same can be said about the video com. Batman's identity as well as the identity of his allies is an important part of the narrative, so they need to be hidden as well as possible. Unfortunately, these identities can be easily exposed if Batman uses a video comp that provides an easy way for enemies of visually identifying both him and his allies. It's true that the video comp does add some facial animations to Batman's allies when they talk to Batman, but these animations aren't very expressive. I think the best scenes of Batman's allies over the comm link are the emotional scenes when they're really worried about someone, such as when Barbara is worried about Robin being kidnapped by Scarecrow. I don't think the animation does the best job of portraying the worry on her face. Rather, I think the voice acting does a much better job. The same is true of other characters, such as Gordon when he's worried about Barbara. When they're worried, it's not really their animations over the comp that does the best job of conveying their worry, it's the great voice acting. So yeah, the video comp doesn't add much to the game, but instead takes away a lot. So yeah, it would have been better if it was just a regular radio video comp like an Asylum and City and Origins. The last thing I want to point out is that Knight's narrative has a number of glaring similarities with Asylum's narrative in terms of structure. Both games' plots involve a psychological supervillain making use of some kind of chemical to drive everyone in Gotham crazy. To make their plans work, the supervillains has to make use of some scientist who they got to work for them. Both of these scientists have second thoughts about working for them, but each supervillain still manages to get what they want out of them. Whatever chemicals these supervillains are using can only be countered from Ivy's plans, so Batman has to get Ivy to help him by threatening her with the life of her plans. Batman also finds Ivy locked up when he first meets her in each game. Additionally, Batman ends up seeing a member of the Gordon family die, but they're not really dead and later Batman finds them alive. 
Batman also has to save his friend Commissioner Gordon at the end of the game who has been taken hostage by the psychological supervillain. I think there are a bit too many similarities between the plots of both these games. As I said earlier, one of the things that makes a Batman Arkham game great is how unique each of them is. It's difficult to do this if you just recycle the plot. There's been a lot of criticism regarding the identity of the Arkham Knight. I'm pretty sure it's because of how Rocksteady marketed him. This is what they said on an episode of Arkham Insider. And a completely original and new character in the Arkhamverse. What was it like writing a completely new character from scratch with no history whatsoever? Well, it was a great opportunity for us to to really build on the Arkham lore and, and yeah. create our own original character for the first time. Yeah. Really, Rocksteady? Really? I'm pretty sure Jason Todd does have a history in the comics and film. I think that disqualifies the Arkham Knight from being a completely original and new character in the Arkhamverse. Maybe Rocksteady's marketing team just hadn't read the comics about Jason. Anyway, one of the biggest mistakes that Rocksteady made with Knight is that they relied too much on two elements to make the entire game stand out. And they devoted a lot of time and money to these two elements. These two elements were the Arkham Knight and the Batmobile. I think Rocksteady wanted the Arkham Knight to have the same impact on the fan base that the Joker did when people first played Asylum. So how much the player enjoys both the Arkham Knight and the Batmobile contributes a lot to how much they enjoy Knight overall, because a lot of the game is spent with them. If the player doesn't like either of them that much, then their enjoyment of the game isn't going to be that great. We'll talk about the Batmobile later, so for now let's focus on the Arkham Knight. So why didn't the Arkham Knight end up being the next Joker? Well, other than his identity, there are a couple of reasons. To start, the Arkham Knight has essentially nothing to do with Arkham, so his name is incredibly misleading. The only connection he has with Arkham is that he was tortured in an abandoned old ward there. That's a pretty weak connection. Using that logic, if he was tortured in an abandoned old room in a warehouse, then he would call himself the Warehouse Knight. The fact that this villain was called the Arkham Knight made us think that there was some kind of connection between him and the events in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, but there was none. I understand the importance of not being predictable in a narrative, but I think you should really only do the unexpected if it makes the narrative better. I don't see how giving a major character with an unknown identity a misleading name makes the narrative better. The Arkham Knight also has a pretty hypocritical personality. He keeps calling Batman old despite the fact that the supervillains who helped fund his military are as old as Batman. He also says that Batman ultimately only cares about himself and the mission rather than his allies. If he really believes that, then why doesn't he have a personality opposite to it? I mean, if the Arkham Knight believes Batman doesn't really care about his allies, then shouldn't the Arkham Knight himself be someone who greatly cares about his allies? I mean, the Arkham Knight trained the soldiers in the militia, but there's no evidence that he has any strong personal connections with any of them. He doesn't even call any of them by their first name or show any concern for their welfare. He treats them the same way he believes Batman treats his subordinates. The biggest example of the Arkham Knight's hypocrisy is how he blames what the Joker did to him on Batman. If you just read Jason Todd's bio, then it becomes obvious that wasn't Batman's fault. Jason Todd was originally abandoned on the street with nobody to take care of him. Batman found this guy trying to steal parts from the Batmobile for money. Then what did Batman do? Did he turn him in? No. Batman took him in. He gave him food, shelter, guidance, and a proper role in his life as the new Robin. But then what happened? Well, Jason Todd didn't like how Batman refused to kill the Joker, so he decided to kill the Joker himself. However, he was no match for the Joker, so he got himself captured, tortured, and almost killed, leaving Batman riddled with guilt. So the Joker capturing and torturing Jason Todd wasn't Batman's fault. Batman made it clear that he didn't want the Joker killed. It's also obvious that Batman didn't want Jason to face the Joker himself. However, Jason decided to disobey his orders. That disobedience ended up ruining his entire life, but instead of blaming himself, 
Jason decided to blame it on Batman and sets out to kill him. Do you see how ridiculous this all sounds? How can I feel sympathetic for this guy? Batman found him on the streets. He gave him food, shelter, security, guidance, and a purpose in life. However, Jason threw it all away by disobeying Batman's orders. Then he ended up ruining his life, and then he decided to blame it all on Batman. I understand that Jason is supposed to be a man controlled by his fears, but he's way too irrational. I mean, look at what he's saying to Batman after he reveals his identity to him. He tells Batman that he always trusted him. That's not true. His bio clearly states that Jason didn't trust Batman's no-kill policy. Jason also tells Batman that Batman is responsible for who Jason is now. That's ridiculous. Jason made the foolish decision to try and kill the Joker. It's not like Batman ordered Jason to face the Joker or the Joker captured Jason when he was patrolling Gotham under Batman's orders. Jason went to the Joker of his own free will. This is a fairly consistent problem with Knight's narrative. While Rocksteady seems to have a good idea of what to do with it, they just make some really strange writing decisions. One of these decisions is how they rewrote Jason Todd's backstory from the comics and the film. In the comics and the film, Jason Todd was a victim of circumstance. What happened to him wasn't his fault. If Rocksteady had kept that backstory more consistent with the comics and film, then the accusations that Jason would make towards Batman would have had more weight, and Jason overall would have been a more sympathetic character. A really bizarre decision that was made with the Arkham Knight was how the tie-in comic about his origins contradicts the small backstory we get about him in the game. For example, in the comic, Jason Todd didn't first meet Batman when he was caught stealing tires from the Batmobile. He first met Batman when he saved him from the Joker. Jason also didn't decide to hunt down the Joker of his own free will. He was captured by the Joker when he disobeyed Batman's orders to not get involved in battle. I guess all this means is that the comic isn't canon. But why would you release a comic which was supposed to reveal the origin of a new character if the origin which is revealed isn't supposed to be canon? Another awkward decision that Rocksteady made was to get Jason Todd to become the Red Hood after he was done being the Arkham Knight. So basically, Jason becomes a vigilante who goes around killing criminals. So he's still resorting to using murder. I mean, it's not like the last time he resorted to using murder, he didn't end up ruining his entire life. I don't agree with Rocksteady's decision to have Red Hood included in Knight. I think they did it to stop people from thinking the Arkham Knight was Jason Todd. However, I think they may not have thought of all the story implications that would have. Remember, what was one of the primary themes of City? The deceit of death. City's narrative was all about how you shouldn't use death to solve your problems. Death only creates a false sense of security. It makes you think you've easily solved your problems. However, things would just get worse when you trusted death. Knight, however, throws this all out of the window with Red Hood. I mean, just look at what this guy is doing. Okay, okay, stop! At the docks! He's keeping the guns at the docks! Appreciate that! Downtown, his office. But you ain't gonna get him. He knows you're coming, freak! He's just relentlessly killing everyone and he keeps succeeding at getting away with it. This feels like a slap in the face to City's themes. Night is supposed to be a continuation of the story from City. So they take place in the same world and there needs to be thematic consistency between them. When I see a world where the use of murder is constantly punished and another world where the use of wanton murder is rewarded, then I have trouble buying that they are the same world. As Batman Arkham Knight is supposed to be the conclusion of Rocksteady's Batman Arkham Trilogy, Rocksteady really needs to make it feel like it's set in the same world as Asylum and City. Anyway, now let's talk about the Arkham Knight in terms of gameplay. Despite encountering the Arkham Knight numerous times throughout the game, we don't get any satisfying boss battles with him. Throughout the entire game, the Arkham Knight boasts about how he knows Batman. We even see him warning his militia to check the vents by the vantage points and move in groups. It's clear that this guy knows Batman inside out. However, we don't really see any of that when he finally faces Batman in battle. The battle with the Arkham Knight is basically just a game of hide and seek. 
we have to keep sneaking up to him again and again and again. This doesn't do the Arkham Knight any justice. The Arkham Knight knows Batman, so we have to see this in a battle with him. The vantage points have to be mined, the vents have to be bombed, and the thugs have to be moving in groups. We see this in regular battles, but not in the battle with the Arkham Knight. What's more disappointing is that designing the boss battle with the Arkham Knight should have just been a natural extension of a boss battle that Rocksteady had already done in City. Remember the boss battle with Freeze? It was principally similar to what the boss battle with the Arkham Knight should have ideally been. Every time Batman does a move, Freeze learns from it and does something to counter it. For example, after Batman attacks Freeze from the grate, Freeze freezes the grate to prevent Batman from doing that attack again. Conceptually, the battle with the Arkham Knight is similar to this. The only difference is that the Arkham Knight already knows all of Batman's moves. He should already have counters to all of them ready before he even challenges Batman. But wait, if the Arkham Knight already has counters to all of Batman's moves, then how is Batman going to defeat him? Well, I think an interesting way of going about doing this, both in terms of gameplay and story, is through dual play. What is dual play? It's when Batman works with one of his allies to take out a group of enemies that have them outmatched. What does the Arkham Knight think of Batman in regards to how he treats allies? He believes Batman doesn't really care about his allies and ultimately just sees them as tools. If the Arkham Knight boss battle was designed to be a dual play with Robin, then it would be a great way to both mechanically and thematically address this issue. Like suppose the Arkham Knight has planted some bombs in a vent. While Batman distracts the Arkham Knight and his forces, Robin can come in and defuse them. Later, Batman can use those vents. Similarly, if the Arkham Knight ever attacks Robin, Batman can jump in and help him fight back via free flow combat in dual play. That'll show the relationship between Batman and Robin and show that Batman really sees Robin as more than just a tool. The first thing I like to do is highlight the change in Scarecrow's character from Asylum to Knight. He's clearly not the same person anymore, so what about him has changed as a character? Well, I think it's how he uses fear. In Asylum, Scarecrow just wanted to use fear to drive people insane. You've ingested enough toxins to drive dead men insane! However, in Night, he wants to use fear to control people. Once I understood your greatest fear, controlling you was simple. Scarecrow is supposed to be the leader of a supervillain alliance at night, so I think it's an appropriate evolution for him to become a guy obsessed with control. However, I would have liked to see or at least hear about how he transitioned into such a character. What made him decide to start using fear to control people rather than just to drive them insane? The last we saw of him in Asylum, he was snatched away by Killer Croc. Did that have something to do with it? We don't know because even Scarecrow's audio tapes don't provide any insight on how his character was developed between the events of Asylum and Night. Now let's talk about Scarecrow's portrayal in Night. I think Rocksteady did a good job with his depiction in Night, but overall I prefer his portrayal in Asylum. Why? Well, because I think Asylum did a better job of portraying him as an enigma of fear. There's a fine line of difference between a man and an enigma. Basically, an enigma has a more mysterious atmosphere around them. An enigma feels like something that you can't truly understand. Most of the time when a character is portrayed as an enigma in a narrative, they only make a handful of appearances in the story. A good example of this is G-Man from Half-Life. In Asylum, Rocksteady did a good job with making sure that Scarecrow only got a handful of appearances. However, in Night, they have him appear a bit too many times. That really takes away from the otherworldliness of his character. I know Scarecrow is supposed to be the main antagonist of the game, but plenty of main antagonists have only made a few appearances. Another aspect of Scarecrow that really made him feel like an enigma in Asylum was his sound design. Are you enjoying the extra dose, little bit? 
Scarecrow's voice has this creepy, heavily echoed effect to it. And that made so much sense to me because, to me, fear is an echo you hear in your head. I also like how little Scarecrow was made to speak at Asylum, especially with how he was taunting Batman. Whenever Scarecrow was trying to mess up Batman's mind, he focused more on using visual stimulus rather than sound. A Scarecrow is supposed to be a Scarecrow. It's supposed to be a visual entity. Portraying Scarecrow as a man of few words really made him feel like an enigma. However, this great design mostly gets thrown out of the window at night. Scarecrow talks way too much in the game. There's too much focus on what Scarecrow is saying rather than what he's actually doing. And that really takes away from the idea of Scarecrow being a visual entity. Scarecrow has also lost most of the echoed effect to his voice and that just makes his voice sound less appealing to me. I think John Noble did a good job at portraying a supervillain's voice but I don't think the voice we got was good enough to be Scarecrow's voice. Scarecrow just sounds like a man wearing a costume rather than a mysterious enigma. The truly ironic thing about all this is that Scarecrow's entire plan at night involves making Batman into a regular person. He doesn't want Batman to be an enigma anymore. He wants Batman to just be human. He says this himself. Now the world can see you for what you truly are. A legend laid bare. Powerless. Human. Afraid. If Scarecrow wants Batman to be downgraded from an enigma into just a man, then shouldn't Scarecrow himself be more than just a man? Shouldn't Scarecrow be an enigma? Shouldn't Scarecrow be portrayed as something that's beyond just human? Knight's narrative wants us to accept Scarecrow as an enigma of fear, but I don't think it does a good enough job of convincing us that he is one. The last thing that I'd like to talk about is quite controversial. Ludo narrative dissonance. This word has become quite infamous in recent years, as too many games have been accused of committing it. However, I think a fair case can be made with a certain aspect of Scarecrow at Night. Let's start by recalling what ludonarrative dissonance is supposed to mean. Ludonarrative dissonance is when gameplay and story contradict each other. To correctly identify it, I think you need a good understanding of what's going on in the story and how it relates to the mechanics of the game. Scarecrow's plan at night was to reduce Batman into just a man by terrifying him. Kill him and you martyr him. You make him a legend, but break him. Humiliate him, terrify him, and hold him up for the world to see. Then he's nothing but a man. Scarecrow wouldn't even let the Arkham Knight kill Batman until Scarecrow himself first gets the chance to break Batman. Time to die, old man. In death, he has nothing left to fear. Keep him away from Ace Chemicals. Your vengeance will come. So Scarecrow is determined to not let Batman be killed until he terrifies him. He won't even let the Arkham Knight, his second in command, kill Batman until he achieves this goal. Even after Gordon apparently kills Batman, Scarecrow is really disappointed. Did you think I wanted him dead? Did you think that would save your daughter? However, the funny thing is that Scarecrow doesn't seem very disappointed after the militia kill Batman. This is the end, Dark Knight. You have nothing to be afraid of anymore. Compare this with the Arkham Knight and Gordon again. Time to die, old man. In death, he has nothing left to fear. Keep him away from Ace Chemicals. Your vengeance will come. Did you think I wanted him dead? Did you think that would save your daughter? See the contradiction? When the Arkham Knight wanted to kill Batman, Scarecrow ordered him not to. When Gordon seemingly kills Batman, Scarecrow is really disappointed. When the militia kill Batman, Scarecrow doesn't seem to care. That doesn't make any sense. 
However, that's not the only contradiction there is in Scarecrow's character. The other contradiction is that he has hired an entire military to take on Batman. Scarecrow doesn't want to kill Batman. He wants to capture Batman and scare him. He wants to ensure that Batman isn't killed because he can't scare Batman when Batman is dead. So why does Scarecrow hire a military to do the job of capturing Batman? Is it the main purpose of a military to kill people? I mean, does Scarecrow really expect that the people in this militia are in trying to kill Batman? Sc Scarecrow's plan just becomes more illogical the more you think about it. It's clear that the soldiers in the militia are trying to kill Batman. At no point in the game does it look like they're just trying to capture him. This is ludonarrative dissonance. Now to be fair, Night isn't the first Batman Arkham game where the main antagonist didn't want Batman killed. In Asylum, the Joker didn't want Batman killed either. He just wanted Batman to be captured or delayed until he could finish organizing his party. However, it is possible for the Joker's thugs in Asylum to kill Batman. They're not supposed to, but I guess they don't always follow orders that well. This is what the Joker says is one of his thugs kills Batman. That cute the little bats are sleeping. Someone finish him off. You can argue that's also a contradiction, as it would make more sense for the Joker to be disappointed with Batman's death. However, the Joker has a sporadic mentality, so it's not totally unbelievable that he would change his mind about Batman dying if one of his thugs ends up killing Batman. However, you can't say the same thing about Scarecrow in Night. This guy has a plan, and he's obviously sticking to it at the end of the game. I mean, Gordon shoots Batman near the end of the game and Scarecrow is still disappointed. That means that Scarecrow is still determined to make Batman afraid before killing him, even near the end of the game. Additionally, I can kind of buy that Joker's thugs in Asylum aren't supposed to kill Batman. Most of them are unarmed, and the most deadly weapon they have is a gun. However, I can't buy that the militia in Night isn't trying to kill Batman. Other than the fact that they're heavily armed, these guys have drones, tanks, choppers. How are these guys not trying to kill Batman? When these guys get their tanks to blow up the Batmobile with Batman in it, there's no way you can argue they're not trying to kill Batman. There's no way that these guys are just trying to capture Batman for Scarecrow. So yeah, while the whole idea of Batman fighting an army was cool in concept, it doesn't fit in well into the narrative of Night. The gameplay with the militia is inconsistent with the plan that Scarecrow has, and that's ludonarrative dissonance. Something about the Batman series that isn't talked about enough is how important psychology is to the series. Basically, a good Batman story needs to explore a unique psychological perspective. That's why a lot of Batman's villains have unique psychologies. The Batman Arkham games seem to recognize the importance of psychology and try to incorporate it as best as they could. There are a bunch of psychological scenes throughout the series. Some are better than the others, so I'll examine them now to see what works and what doesn't. I think there's an unanimous agreement among the fanbase that the Scarecrow psychological scenes in Asylum were the best psychological scenes in the series. They really put you in this surreal world that Batman doesn't seem to have full control over. Two main reasons why these scenes are so successful are because of the camera angles and the simplistic gameplay. The camera follows Scarecrow just as much as it does Batman. It feels like Scarecrow is in control of the camera as much as the player, and that really adds to the idea of Batman trying to save his sanity from the Scarecrow. The gameplay is also simplistic as it mostly just involves platforming and stealthing your way through the level. I think the gameplay in a psychological scene needs to be simple. It doesn't make sense for someone who's struggling with their mind to do complex tasks. The gameplay should be simple, but the experience should be enhanced by the visuals, camera angles, and sound. Basically, the psychological scenes have to be the best, easiest parts of the game. This is the primary reason why I dislike how Rocksteady shoved free-flow combat sequences into the last Scarecrow scene. It didn't need them. Besides, free-flow combat sequences don't really fit into most of the psychological scenes. They're too logical. 
When I see Batman moving around like a level-headed martial artist, it doesn't look like he's struggling to keep his mentality together. The final reason why the Scarecrow scenes are the best is because of how they use the meta technique on the player to really instill how Batman would feel in such a situation. During the beginning of one of the Scarecrow sequences, Batman is just walking through a corridor. Then it looks like a glitch has occurred. The moment the player sees that, they'll think that there's something wrong with their game or console and that will instill fear in them. This fear is carried on by a sudden unexplained role reversal between Batman and the Joker which results into the apparent death of Batman. None of the other psychological scenes in the series employed a meta technique like this. Well, actually, they didn't employ any meta technique at all, and that's why I think most people will never consider the other psychological scenes to be as great as the Scarecrow scenes in Asylum. Anyway, the next best psychological scenes in the Batman Arkham series are the Mad Hatter scenes in Origins. With the exception of the meta technique, it does everything that the Scarecrow scenes in Asylum did right. It has the player control Batman from these very weird camera angles. It also keeps gameplay simplistic for the most part. Unfortunately, it also had free flow combat sequences shoehorned in the middle. However, I like how it made use of more strategic gameplay near the end of the level. That made sense to me. Near the end of the level, Batman was beginning to regain control of his mind, so he would be able to think more clearly. This regain of thought is reflected in how he would be able to solve more strategic platforming puzzles at the end of the level compared to the start of the level. Out of the Joker and Copperhead, I'd say the one with the better psychological scenes would be the Joker. Why? Well, there are a number of reasons. To begin with, the Joker scenes employs the use of awkward camera angles. The Copperhead scene only adds somewhat of a clouded effect to the camera and I don't think that's enough. The other thing is the setting. I'm not sure if I would say that a psychological scene needs to be as good as much as it needs to be strange. Since it's presented in a realm of mental struggle, it has to look strange. It has to look like something that doesn't fit anywhere else in the game. It has to have somewhat of a jarring appearance to it. The Scarecrow scenes achieve this by having destroyed parts of Arkham Asylum connected together. The Mad Hatter scene in Origins achieved this by having a wacky world like Wonderland. The Joker scenes in Origins achieved this with some surreal amusement park. However, the Copperhead scenes in Origins just take place inside the regular steel mill, and that just doesn't feel as powerful. This is the same reason why I felt the Mad Hatter scene in City wasn't as well done as it was in Origins. Other than the reliance on combat, the setting just doesn't seem as powerful as it was in Origins. The small size of the setting is an issue. I think the setting needs to be fairly big to have a significant impact on the player. The reason for this is because for most of the game, the player will be playing in an environment that's a lot different from the psychological environment. And this environment will make a lot more sense than the kind of environment that one can expect in a psychological setting. To really get the player in the zone when they're in a psychological setting, the psychological setting has to be large and it has to take some time to traverse through. Additionally, Copperhead doesn't feel like an enigma in her world. She's portrayed in a mysterious way, but I think it's her lack of presence that ultimately makes her feel like a character in the world rather than an enigma who created the world. In the Scarecrow and Mad Hatter scenes, both Scarecrow and Mad Hatter feel omnipresent in the world despite the fact that we're not controlling them. It's probably because we can hear them speaking during the entire scene. On the other hand, Copperhead is pretty quiet until she physically appears in front of Batman. However, I think there's a common mistake made in the psychological scenes for both the Joker and Copperhead. The interference of pre-rendered cutscenes. The gameplay in their surreal world just takes place with in-engine graphics. However, there are these pre-rendered cutscenes that are placed at the middle and end of the levels. You can easily tell the difference between in-engine graphics and pre-rendered graphics. So whenever a pre-rendered cutscene turns up, it just breaks the flow of the psychological scene. I think the art style needs to stay consistent in order to effectively depict a struggle for sanity. So I think all the cutscenes should have been done with in-engine graphics. I'd also like to add that I don't like how a free flow combat sequence was shoehorned into the Joker scene. It really didn't need it. The Copperhead scene on the other hand, I can kind of accept needed some kind of combat. 
I mean, Copperhead's strategy was to poison her opponents and then finish them off. Similarly, I can accept the matter had her seen in Night needed combat as well, as it was taking Batman through the events of the previous games. I still don't think free flow combat is the best way to do a psychological scene, so I still prefer the Mad Hatter scenes in Origins overall. However, I do like how the Mad Hatter scene in Night decided to go for a change in art style. That really added to the surrealism of the scene, and is something I wouldn't mind seeing incorporated into other psychological scenes. The demon trials in City can also be argued to be psychological scenes, but they didn't resonate with me that much. I think the setting is great, but it lacked the charm of the Mad Hatter and Scarecrow scenes for a number of reasons. For example, they don't make use of the camera for any added effect, and there are also too many free flow combat sequences, which really take away from the surrealism. Anyway, ever since Scarecrow was announced as the main antagonist of Knight, I think many people were hoping that there would be some great new psychological scenes with him in the game. Unfortunately, we don't get any. Batman is more troubled by the Joker than Scarecrow in the psychological plane, so all our psychological scenes are Joker scenes. Are the Joker psychological scenes effective? For the most part, I think they are. Joker is trying to control Batman with fear, and I think the psychological scenes do add to that idea. It's true that only the last one takes place in a surreal setting, and most of them take place in a pretty normal environment, but I'm okay with that. Joker doesn't have as much control of Batman in the earlier parts of the game, so it makes sense if his earlier scenes don't depict him to be in a dominant position over Batman. The free flow combat sequences are okay. I don't think Joker as a character works that well in hand to hand combat, but I don't know how else Rocksteady was supposed to depict a mental struggle between him and Batman in terms of gameplay. The only thing I really don't like about the Joker scenes is how a few of them were made to look like they were making a big change in Batman's character, but they actually didn't. What I'm referring to is how a few of these scenes have Batman break his no kill rule. In one of these scenes, Batman shoots Scarecrow and in the other one, Batman breaks the Joker's neck. You'd normally expect there to be a change in Batman's character after he does something like that. Like maybe he would become more aggressive or hit harder. However, we don't see any of that. After those psychological scenes are over, Batman behaves no differently from how he was behaving before those scenes even began. I really don't understand this decision. What was the purpose of showing Batman break his no kill rule if it didn't mark a significant change in his character? In the behind the scenes of Asylum, Rocksteady said they designed the cinematic specifically so they showed a passive Batman. Whenever Batman was shown really active, they wanted the player to be in control of him. I think that's a good design decision in a superhero game. However, not all of Rocksteady's cinematics in Asylum had Batman in a passive state. One of these ones was the cutscene in which Batman fought Bane and had to use the Batmobile to take him out. This involved a very active Batman, but that's not my main point of contention regarding this issue. My main point of contention is that Batman did something in the cinematic that he couldn't do in gameplay. He ordered the Batmobile to auto-drive towards Bane and take him out. I really don't like it when cinematic show characters do things that they can't do in-game. One thing I applaud the Batman Arkham games for doing is for restricting their cinematics to only show their characters do what they can do in-game. This is true of not only the cinematics in-game, but also the cinematics you see in their marketing. If you watch the pre-rendered cinematics for City and Night, you'll see that they mostly only depict Batman using fighting moves that he has in-game. They depict Batman using the gadgets that he has in-game. Even the enemies are only able to attack Batman the same way they attack him in-game. When creating a pre-rendered cinematic, it's difficult to resist the temptation of going overboard with it, since there aren't any restrictions to it like there are with an in-engine cinematic. I think that's why we see so many characters doing things in cinematics that they can't do in-game. However, Rocksteady, especially their marketing team, should be praised for not going overboard with their pre-rendered cinematics. It's true that some of the things they say might not always be so reliable, but the stuff they show is almost always trustworthy. 
Anyway, having pre-rendered cinematics only depict Batman and his enemies doing what they can do in-game creates a bond of loyalty between gameplay and cutscenes. It shows that even when the player is not playing as Batman, Batman is only able to do things that the player can make him do. So it doesn't feel like the player is really missing out on anything when the cutscene steals control of Batman from him. On the other hand, if the cinematics depict Batman doing things that he can't do in-game, then it kind of makes the player feel cheated, and that's not good for the experience. I can kind of forgive Rocksteady for the Bane cutscene, because it looked like that they just wanted to show off the Batmobile in action. I think in Asylum, they wanted to introduce the Batmobile, but they couldn't find the time to get it done right, so they just decided to relocate it to a pre-rendered cinematic. I can understand that. What I have trouble overlooking, however, is the final cinematic with the Joker. The boss battle with the Joker wasn't that great, and the cinematic at the end even takes away more from the experience. It not only robs control of Batman from the player, but it also has Batman do this explosive gel punch attack to finish the Joker off. Wait, Batman can't do that in-game. No matter how much you upgrade him in, in Asylum, you can't get Batman to spray his fists with explosive gel and get him to punch with them. That's a move which is only possible in the cinematic, and it breaks the otherwise strong loyalty that existed between the cinematics and the gameplay of Asylum. Loyalty aside, Batman isn't even passive in that cutscene. He's attacking, so the player should have control of him. That's something I've noticed about the Batman Arkham series. Some of the worst received battles are the ones that involve a cinematic stealing control of Batman from the player. A lot of people dislike the boss battle with Deathstroke in Night, and I think it wasn't just because it was a tank battle. It was also because the actual physical battle between Batman and Deathstroke was just a cutscene. However, other than a few instances, it seems that Rocksteady uses cinematics really well in the Batman Arkham games. They really do add to the experience. Unfortunately, I don't think Warner Brothers used the cinematics as well as Rocksteady did. Now, for the most part, I think Warner Brothers did do a fine job. The cinematics in Origins almost always depict a passive Batman, and they mostly only show him doing what he can do in-game. However, there is a certain cinematic that keeps coming up a lot and ends up hindering the entire experience. Know what cinematic that is? It's the fast travel cinematic. Batman is flying the Batwing in that cinematic. Wait, that's not something that he can do when I'm controlling him. When I see Batman in a plane, I want control of that plane. I don't want to sit back and watch. Above all this, I don't think a fast travel mechanic fits in the game, especially with how it was implemented in Origins. Rocksteady said so themselves that travel was always meant to be a part of the Batman Arkham series, and that's why they never implemented a fast travel mechanic in the Batman Arkham games which they designed. I agree with that decision. A Batman Arkham game has to have a setting that's just great to look at. It needs to have such a strong setting that traveling should be an experience in of itself. However, I'd like to add that one of the aspects that adds to a strong setting in the Batman Arkham series is how connected this entire setting is. The setting has to feel like a real place and everywhere you can visit in it has to be traversable for Batman. That's why I believe the Batcave never made an appearance in Rocksteady's Batman Arkham games. The Batcave is located a fair distance away from the city of Gotham. If it were to appear in a fully connected open world, then Rocksteady would have to design the forest as well as Wayne Manor. However, these locations are far away from Gotham City, Arkham City, and Arkham Asylum. It didn't make sense to extend the size of the world so much to just add one iconic location. Thus, Rocksteady decided to make a few substitutes for the Batcave. They introduced a second Batcave in Asylum, and they had the clock tower fulfill the purpose of the Batcave in Night. Batman was able to travel to these locations because they were located where all the action was. Now compare this to how Warner Brothers implemented the Batcave in Origins. Since it was located away from Gotham, they couldn't fit it onto the traversable map. They ended up putting it a cutscene away from the rest of the action. That just made the setting of Origins feel disconnected. I mean, sure, I can traverse a snowy Gotham as Batman, but I, I can't reach the Batcave as Batman. This disconnect just made the setting of Origins feel all the more weaker. 
I think Rocksteady should be commended for designing such an interesting arsenal of gadgets for Batman to use. However, that doesn't mean they don't have a few design flaws. Let's take a look. I noticed one of the biggest problems with Batman's gadgets during City. As I examined everything in his arsenal, I noticed that a lot of his gadgets had a common purpose. To open the door. How many of Batman's gadgets are used to open the door or for a similar effect? Well, let's see. The explosive gel, the cryptographic sequencer, the remote electric charger, and the remote controlled batarang. Now to be fair, some of these gadgets have other uses, but they're mostly just used for creating some kind of passageway. I don't really like this design decision. I think an effective arsenal of gadgets should have a unique purpose for each gadget. If a certain gadget is just fulfilling the purpose of another, then it kind of feel like it's the other gadget with a different coat of paint. Additionally, I think having too many gadgets which are used to just open the door kind of takes away from the feeling of playing as Batman. Batman is supposed to be the world's greatest detective, but if he has so many gadgets for opening the door, then he starts to feel like a thief. I think the fact that so many of Batman's gadgets are used to mostly just open the door isn't really a surprise. I think most story-driven games have opened the door puzzles as the most common type of puzzle. I think it's because almost every single story-driven game involves getting a character from point A to point B. However, I do think good design can stop these tasks from feeling repetitive. Now, I do think the gadgets in the later games were better designed. I think the shot gloves in Origins had a balanced role in both combat and opening the door, despite the fact that the shock gloves were pretty overpowered in combat. I also think the gadgets in Night were better designed. The cryptographic sequencer was replaced with the remote hacking device, which can hack drones and turn consoles on and off as well as open the door. Additionally, the voice synthesizer in Night was used not only to, to trick thugs into opening the door, but also into luring them into traps. However, I think more could have been done with the voice synthesizer. I felt the gadget was underused at night. I mean, considering all the different voices we had in the game, this gadget could have easily fitted into several of the most wanted missions. I think it would have been interesting to see its use in more puzzles. I also think the process of capturing voice could have been more strategic. I mean, Batman always has the voice he needs pre-recorded somehow, even when it doesn't make any sense for that to be the case. For example, the voice synthesizer has already captured Stag's voice when Batman needs it. I've got so much money, even Batman won't be able to stop us. But wait, when did Stag say this? Oh yeah. Please let me go. I've got so much money, even Batman won't be able to stop us. There is no way Batman could have had that gadget capture Stag's voice from across the room. It would have been better if reaching Stag and capturing his voice was part of the challenge. That would have been an interesting mechanic in the game. Batman has to find a way to get up close to someone in order to capture their voice. This will test the player's ability to stealth. Batman can't just knock out the person because they won't say anything for him to record. He has to find a way to sneak up to them, wait for them to talk, and then capture their voice at that exact moment. The last thing I'd like to touch upon is the detective work in the series. I think most people believe that the boss battles are the weakest part of the Batman Arkham series. However, I have a different opinion. I think that detective work is the weakest part of the series. Why? Well, because it doesn't make you feel like the world's greatest detective. In order to feel like the world's greatest detective, I really need to feel like I've used my brain to solve a difficult case that only a few people can solve. However, detective mode doesn't allow me to do that. It's too handholdy. Most of the time, I'm just directed to scan something and then Batman solves the entire case for me. That's not good enough. I need to be given the opportunity to really think about the case. I need to feel like I'm playing a role in the mystery solving process. I should feel like Batman, but unfortunately I end up feeling more like Batman's Watson. Honestly, figuring out the Joker's plan in Asylum or solving the Riddler's puzzles made me feel more like a detective than the detective work in the Batman Arkham games ever did. Now to be fair, the detective work in Night did improve. We usually weren't given any instructions on what to scan, so we had to decide ourselves what to scan. 
we also had to rewind footage and find all the important details ourselves. However, we are still divorced from most of the thinking process, so I don't think that's enough. However, I can't really blame Rocksteady for not having designed the best detective scenes. I think detective work is something really difficult to get right in games. I think to do it interactively, you're going to have to design for multiple scenarios that takes into account the possibility of you making incorrect deductions. Something like L.A. Neuer comes to mind. However, the problem is that in L.A. Neuer, you're controlling a rookie who makes his way up to the top. In a Batman game, you already are at the top. You're the world's greatest detective. Batman shouldn't make too many mistakes. So I'm not sure how you can design interactive detective work in a Batman game. A possible idea is if you make the detective work partially interactive and the rest handholdy. So somewhat with gameplay and somewhat with cutscenes. Then you might be able to find the right balance of Batman making correct and incorrect deductions. Before I begin, I'd like to talk a bit about how I believe dual play impacted the narrative of Night. Traditionally, the Batman Arkham games have provided very personal stories for Batman. They've mostly been about Batman and how he relates to his supervillains who are just alternate reflections of Batman himself. Asylum City and Origins have Batman and his supervillains as the main characters. They worked really well to create a good Batman story, because the crux of a good Batman story is an exploration of unique psychological concepts. Batman and his supervillains had unique psychologies. However, Knight takes a different approach by relegating most of Batman's supervillains as side characters and instead puts the spotlight on his allies. Why did they do this? Well, I think one of the reasons was dual play. The way I see it, dual play was Rocksteady's way of compensating the fanbase for never designing a multiplayer for the series. Since it involved Batman working with other members of the Bat Family, then I guess Rocksteady decided that the Bat Family needed to make more than a cameo appearance at night. Unfortunately, I don't think giving the Bat Family a larger role at the expense of the supervillains did the narrative many favors. The biggest problems with Batman's allies is that they don't have the psychological complexity that Batman and the supervillains have. Barbara, Gordon, Robin, these are pretty normal people. Giving them larger roles in the story stops the narrative from having that feeling of psychological complexity that we got in Asylum, City, and Origins. Additionally, I don't think the dual play mechanic is integrated that well from a character relationship standpoint. Sefton Hill said in an interview that each dual play section of the game will feature a member of the Bat family that is linked to a specific supervillain. The problem is that this link is really weak. I mean, what does Nightwing have to do with Penguin? They have basically no relationship. The same thing can be said about Riddler and Catwoman. How is either of their stories enhanced by linking them together? Now, there is some link between Robin and Harley, but it's tentative at best. Neither Robin nor Harley further themselves as characters by having their stories linked together. Additionally, I think Harley as a character had a stronger connection with Barbara than she did with Robin. I think one of the main reasons why Rocksteady decided to have a paralyzed stationary girl like Barbara be the main sidekick of Batman throughout the Batman Arkham series is because she acted as a good contrast to an acrobatic lady like Harley who was the sidekick of Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker. Unfortunately, we never really see any kind of relationship between Harley and Barbara play out in the series. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that from a narrative standpoint, dual play feels like filler. The primary theme is it's supposed to be about the control of fear, but the dual play sections only seem to interrupt the narrative. I think a lot more could have been done with dual play, as I earlier mentioned how I think a dual play with Robin could have made for a great boss battle with the Arkham Knight. Other than that, dual play doesn't feel like anything more than just an aesthetic. I know that each of the characters play somewhat differently, but these differences don't seem to be justified. I mean, other than the fact that there are a lot of thugs in the room, I don't have much of an incentive to switch control from Batman to his ally, other than just to see Batman perform a pretty combo with his ally. I would have preferred if each character had a meaningful set of advantages and disadvantages. For example, Nightwing might not hit as hard as Batman, but maybe he could be faster than him. 
so Nightwing would be better suited to take out thugs which move at high speed. This would have made dual play more strategic, as it would make switching between characters feel more like a necessary tactic to defeat a diverse enemy force, rather than just an aesthetic. I think combat in a Batman game has to feel at least somewhat tactical, because it would add to the idea of Batman being a genius and training people to fight in a way which required brains just as much as brawns. I'd also like to add that despite the focus on dual play, I'm surprised that Knight didn't give us a level in which we had to clear a bunch of thugs with Gordon. Gordon is Batman's biggest ally. It's true he's an officer armed with a gun, and it would be strange for somebody armed with a gun to fight alongside Batman, but hey, even Gordon's bio states that he's an expert in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Origins even gave us a level where we could beat up a bunch of thugs with him. In Night, whenever we're with Gordon, he has to take the back seat and let Batman do all the work. I really don't understand this decision. Anyway, speaking of other characters, I find it really strange that Rocksteady made Harley Quinn one of the playable characters. The problem is that Harley, unlike most characters, is really expressive and acrobatic. It'll take a decent amount of animation to get a third person model of her looking good. I don't think the current model we have does her justice. I mean, look at this. See the problem? Harley doesn't look as, as loud as she sounds. Just look at her face. She doesn't look like she's screaming or that she's speaking in a loud voice. I don't know why Rocksteady picked Harley to be a playable character. Her demeanor is so different from everyone else's. If Rocksteady wanted to give us control of a supervillain, they should have picked someone with a more regular demeanor, like Two-Face. I think Rocksteady wanted us to love the Batmobile the same way we love their free flow combat sequences. Knight even has separate cutscenes for when Batman selects what upgrade he wants to apply to the Batmobile, and for when the Batmobile actually gets the upgrade. There are even some parts of the game where Batman has to get out of the Batmobile to do some rewiring just so he can open the door for his beloved car. I mean, it's not like Batman needed another way to open the door. I think the reason why Rocksteady had the Batmobile destroyed by the Arkham Knight was because they wanted to fill us with dread. Examine the scene right before the Batmobile is destroyed. It's supposed to be shocking to us because the Arkham Knight reveals that he knows Batman's secret right before he, he crushes the Batmobile. Losing the Batmobile was supposed to add to the shock because we were supposed to fall in love with the Batmobile after all those glorious tank battles. However, I wouldn't be surprised if some people ended up cheering when they saw the Arkham Knight crush the Batmobile. In fact, these same people might have also ended up crying when Batman revealed that there was a spare Batmobile. Anyway, I think the huge emphasis on the Batmobile is just Rocksteady putting too many of their eggs in one basket. I don't think it's a good idea as a developer to just expect that something that you're going to put in your game is going to end up being a smash success. I mean, suppose a developer spends so much time designing something and putting it anywhere in the game hoping it's going to be popular. What if after they release the game they find out that whatever they designed wasn't that popular and their players are irritated by how heavily incorporated it is in the game? In that case, the developer has pretty much shot themselves in the foot. Critics have described the Batmobile as monotonous and not very fun. Some game journalists have even said that the Batmobile doesn't feel very Batman-like. I think those are valid complaints, but I don't think they're specific enough. Why doesn't the Batmobile feel as great as Lone Control of Batman? For starters, I think it's because the Batmobile sections lack the emotional core we get in the Lone Batman sequences. This is what Rocksteady said about designing combat in the behind the scenes of Asylum. We've got two distinct kind of gameplay modes and we want to achieve, with one of them, we really want to achieve a feeling that you're creating fear in the enemies, that you're really having an emotional impact on them. So an important part of being Batman is to strike fear into our enemies when we attack them. Rocksteady is correct in saying that Predator mode is mostly designed around this concept. But I also think it's fair to say that an element of this is present in free flow combat. Unfortunately, we don't really get to see this element of fear when we use the Batmobile. I mean, compare this.
with this. See the difference? When we pounce on our enemies during free flow combat or predator mode, we can really hear the shock, the terror that only an enigma of fear like Batman can bring when defeating an enemy. On the other hand, when we're using the Batmobile, the thugs are either completely quiet when we blow up their drones, or they speak in a very calm and formal manner about how Batman has destroyed a specific type of drone. This issue would have been simple to resolve. All Rocksteady had to do was to get the thugs to be more emotional when they're controlling the drones. I know that when Batman defeats a drone, the thug controlling it is located in some remote location and doesn't feel any physical pain. However, if there's one thing that games have shown us, it's that you don't need to be physically present to be emotionally invested in an activity. You can control an activity from a distance and still be emotionally invested in it. I think Rocksteady should have had the thugs so emotionally invested in controlling their drones that they cried out in terror whenever Batman took them out. I know that the militia formally announcing that a specific drone type has been taken out also adds to the atmosphere as it lends a degree of professional language to the game, but I think that should only be done after we first hear the thugs cry out in fear. Emotions first, formal talk second. It's also notable that in its current state, the Batmobile doesn't even have an emotional core when it takes on regular militia thugs. When it shoots them down, they don't scream or anything, they just get knocked out silently. Inflicting fear in the enemy is more important than ever, because the control of fear is the primary theme of Night. Each game in the Batman Arkham series had a unique feature that helped further its narrative. For Asylum, it was the claustrophobic environment which added to the theme of insanity. For City, the open world added to the themes of life and death. Unfortunately, the Batmobile in Night doesn't add to the theme of fear, unless we try to run down thugs with the Batmobile. But that's not good enough. The kind of fear that Batman inflicts has to feel unique to Batman. It has to feel like something only Batman can do. Scare people by threatening to run them over with your car? Games have been doing that for ages. Besides, threatening to run down people with a car is more like something a criminal rather than Batman would do. Anyway, a large part about being Batman is having too many options. That's one of the reasons why the open world was a welcome addition in City. It added to the experience, but it didn't take away from it. Obviously, the next logical addition was going to be the inclusion of the Batmobile, However, the Batmobile had a problem that the open world didn't. It's limiting nature. In free flow combat and predator mode, there are several ways you can take down enemies. However, with the Batmobile, you only have a few options. While Rocksteady has tried to give the Batmobile different guns, their function just doesn't feel distinct enough. Unfortunately, entering the Batmobile also means that Batman can no longer use any of his gadgets. All he can do is rely on a couple of not so interesting guns. I think this issue could have been rectified by designing the Batmobile to be more like a gadget and less like a vehicle. Some people have commented on the Batmobile being another one of Batman's gadgets, but I don't really agree with that statement for one important reason. Batman's gadgets aren't limiting in nature. Gadgets are just something Batman can take out, use quickly, and then swap out for another gadget or a fist or a kick. Gadgets don't take away any of Batman's options. However, the Batmobile does. That's the primary difference between the Batmobile and Batman's gadgets. However, I believe this issue could have been resolved by just designing the Batmobile to be more of a gadget and less of a vehicle. What this means is that half the Batmobile sections designed in such a way that they don't limit Batman's options. Basically, this means Batman should use his own body to do the fighting and rely on the Batmobile as just an accessory. That's really how I see Batman in a car. I see him as a guy who breaks every single road rule in the book. 
There are a few ideas for how a design like this could work. You know how the Batmobile can shoot Batman out? Why can't that be an attack? Suppose that Batman is chasing a thug in a getaway car. Wouldn't it be fitting for Batman to gain enough speed and then be shot out of the Batmobile and in through the back of the car? That way Batman can capture the thug the same way a bat captures its prey. This would add some much needed speed to the relatively slow pace that most of the Batmobile sections have as a result of tank mode. I approximated how many Batmobile tank sections there are in the main story, and I was surprised to find out that there were only about 38, which is less than the amount of free flow combat sequences that number 43. I think the slow pace of the Batmobile tank sections just make them feel a lot longer and a lot more numerous than they really are. What we really need are more fast paced sections with the Batmobile. There are only about 3 incidents in the game where you're required to do a chase with the Batmobile. I'd also like to add that a guy named Nefestin on Reddit also had some great ideas for how the Batmobile could be improved. His suggestions include having unmanned tanks replace manned tanks and having Batman drive up close and take out the drivers. I really like that. It's possible for Batman to take out drivers at night, but that feature isn't well integrated into gameplay. Nefistin then goes on to suggest how Batman would have a variety of options when he got onto a tank, like disabling the movement or weapon system. Each tank could also have a different blind spot which Batman could use to climb up. These are really great ideas, and they add some much needed strategy to the Batmobile sections. I can't think of any better suggestions myself. I've added a link to Nefistin's post in the description down below, so go read it yourself for further details. What makes a good boss battle depends on what kind of game they're being implemented in. In the Batman Arkham games, I think a good boss battle shouldn't just work well from a mechanical sense, but also from a narrative sense. You have to feel like you're Batman facing one of his famous supervillains. Since Batman's villains are unique, the boss battles also have to be unique. I think one of the biggest weaknesses with the boss battles in the Batman Arkham games is that they don't try to be unique. The main reason behind this is because Batman usually doesn't face the boss one on one. Random thugs are almost always thrown in. I think the reason Rocksteady does this is because they have trouble figuring out how to do a Batman boss battle. They know how to do a Batman regular battle. Batman has to feel like a predator. He has to be stealthy and clever. He has to take out his enemies quickly and strike fear into their hearts. The problem is that many of these things don't really work with the traditional boss battle formula. I mean a boss battle can't be short, otherwise it'll feel underwhelming. That's why I think Rocksteady just keeps throwing in random thugs into many of their boss battles. The random thugs are used to keep the Batman feel, while Rocksteady does whatever else it wants with the bosses. However, I think there are other ways of getting the Batman feel. As much thought needs to be given to Batman's villains as is given to Batman. The best boss battle in the Batman Arkham series is considered by many to be the battle with Freeze in City. Why did it work so well? I think it's because it brought the narrative and mechanics together to create a truly unique experience. Batman needs to use different stealth moves to take down Mr. Freeze, because attacking Freeze head on would be suicide. After each attack, Freeze finds a way to prevent Batman from doing that attack again. Like he freezes the grades after Batman does an attack from them. This demonstrates Freeze's intellect. Getting Batman to find new ways to defeat Freeze also helps the player feel like Batman because Batman is supposed to be a genius. This fight also made effective use of Batman's gadgets, which really adds to the diversity of being Batman. Many fans consider Origins to be the game that has the best boss battle in the Batman Arkham series. However, I think a flaw with the boss battles in Origins is that they're not diverse enough. Most of them are only focused around trying to test the player's mastery of one of Batman's abilities. For example, the battle with Deathstroke tests how well the player can counter on time. I also noticed that most of the boss battles in Origins don't make effective use of Batman's gadgets. Other than the battle with Firefly, of course. 
Many of the battles tend to neglect all of Batman's gadgets other than the shock gloves. The boss battles in Origins focus too much on Batman as a fighter, and not enough on Batman as a genius inventor. The battle with Freeze in City got the balance right, and that's why I don't think any of the battles in Origins are better than it. So there need to be two main points that need to be addressed in order to create a good boss battle in a Batman Arkham game. First, it needs to make you feel like as much of a genius inventor as a fighter. I think this could have been addressed in the boss battle with Bane in Origins if it had been designed so Batman didn't just have to pull out his Venom tubes with his own hands, but he also had to use the Bat Claw to do it from a distance. The second point is that the unique supervillain really has to feel like a unique supervillain to their design. For example, let's take a look at the battle with Ra's al Ghul in City. I don't think it was designed well enough to really make it feel like we're fighting Ra's al Ghul. A big part of Ra's al Ghul's character is how he keeps reviving himself. I think it would have been interesting if this would have been incorporated into our battle with Ra's al Ghul. Like when we had to fight Ra's al Ghul, during then we had to solve a puzzle at the same time. And by solving that puzzle, we'll be able to create a path which blocks Ra's entry to the Lazarus Pool. If we don't solve the puzzle in time, we'll never beat Resh, because whenever his health drops low, he'll just return to the Lazarus Pit and come back with maximum health. One of the things that I think Rocksteady never quite figured out was how to do a good boss battle with the Joker. The main problem with the Joker is that he's more of a psychological villain than a villain with brute strength. It's difficult to design a psychological battle with the Joker. Especially considering the fact that he's a character which is usually used to represent insanity. I'm not sure how to do a battle with the Joker in which he's a symbol for insanity. I've already spoken about how the Joker was used in a psychological battle when he was a symbol for fear earlier. So instead, now I'd like to focus on how a physical battle with the Joker might work in a Batman Arkham game. Currently, I don't like the physical battles with the Joker which we've gotten, because it's clear that Joker just doesn't work as a fist fighting thug. Whenever Batman is pounding the Joker, I actually feel sorry for the guy. He just doesn't look like he stands a chance. So how can all of this be improved? Well, one of the main reasons why I believe the Joker doesn't work as a fist fighter is because he's a lanky guy. He doesn't look like he can throw a punch like Batman. So what are lanky guys good at? I think that's easy enough to answer. Dodging. I think the Joker should be designed to be an expert dodger. I think it's fitting for the Joker to constantly dodge Batman's punches with his clownish antics. A physical battle with him shouldn't be about hitting him as much as possible, but rather trying to land a hit on him in the first place. I think a big part about the Joker's character is his sporadic nature and I think that can be integrated into a boss battle with him. Basically, in a boss battle with the Joker, the Joker will constantly be dodging Batman's punches. And basically, the Joker changes his dodge pattern every few minutes. So what the player has to do is memorize as many of Joker's dodge patterns as necessary. And during each of these dodge patterns, there will be a moment where the Joker is vulnerable to a specific move of Batman. Like if the Joker is at a distance, then there might be a chance where the Joker will be vulnerable to be pulled to an attack by the Batarang. And similarly, if the Joker is near Batman, then there might be a moment in time where he's vulnerable to a punch by Batman. However, this is all going to be about timing. The Joker will attack Batman in this hypothetical boss battle, but rarely. He's going to do a bunch of dodge patterns and then attack Batman and then Batman has to either dodge the attack or counter the attack. After that, the Joker is going to continue doing that. He's going to dodge, and then he's going to attack. And the Joker will keep switching things up, so this won't be a battle that will end quickly. The player is going to have to memorize a fair number of Joker's dodge patterns before they can land enough blows on him to take him out. I think the Joker switching up his dodge pattern each time is really going to add to the idea of him being unpredictable and sporadic, and I think it'll really fit his character. I've already stated how I believe a good boss battle with the Arkham Knight would have been a dual play battle with Robin, so I won't go into more detail about that here. 
Instead, I'll address the issue of using the Batmobile in boss battles. In my opinion, the boss battles don't really work with the Batmobile. The truth is that most of Batman's villains don't have vehicles that can live up to the Batmobile. So when I see Deathstroke in a tank, it just doesn't feel like Deathstroke. I think the Batmobile is something that should have been exclusively used in battles with regular thugs. According to the Behind the Scenes of Asylum, Rocksteady designed the art style of the game to combine comic book style art with realism. The product was an art style that wasn't either too stylish or too realistic, but rather a good mix between the two. When I look at the art in Asylum and City, everything just seems so well balanced. Even when I look at the characters, I see characters which I can say are 50% stylistic and 50% realistic. The art is just so well balanced. However, this art style didn't last into the later two games. In Origins, the art style was more stylistic than realistic, and in Night, the art was more realistic than stylistic. I don't know why the great art style of, of the first two games was abandoned in the later entries. Nowadays, most games choose to make their art either all realistic or all stylistic. But Rocksteady took a different approach. They said, why not both? Then they proceeded to create an art style that took the best of realism and the best of comic book art and then merged them together into a unique homogeneous mix. Usually, I don't mind a change in art if it really adds to the series, but in the case of the Batman Arkham games, I think it took away from the series. A lot of people say that Origins graphics are bad. I don't entirely agree with that statement. I don't think it's that the graphics of Origins are bad. I just think the art style of Origins is inferior and that took away from how great Origins could have looked. For Night, there's no doubt that the art looks great, but it all looks so realistic. However, that just doesn't feel unique. It feels like they just went for realism because Arkham Knight was next gen and next gen was supposed to be all about realism. A change of art style also takes away from the continuity of the game. Some characters like Ivy look too different from their appearances in Asylum and City. Other characters like the Joker can't help but look a bit jarring. And I'm sure it's because they were made to look more realistic at night. I don't think it's the best idea to go for a change in art style for the conclusion of a trilogy. For the conclusion of a trilogy, you really need to make it feel like the conclusion of a trilogy. It has to feel like the previous entries were leading up to it. And if the art style is different from the previous entries, then it just takes away from the entire experience. Now to be fair, the art style of Asylum and City wasn't exactly the same. There was a certain element of Asylum that had its art redone in City. That element was the user interface. I'm referring to things like the heads up display and the main menu. In Asylum, they were designed with a very loyal comic book art style. Whenever you were selecting your gadgets, upgrading your moves, looking at the map or looking at the life bar, you'll notice that they're all drawn with this comic book style. However, in City, they were replaced with a style that's a bit more realistic while still retaining some of that comic book style. But anyway, my point is that the change in the heads up display and the main menu in City was a welcome addition to the series because the change was more consistent with the realistic stylistic hybrid art that Asylum and City already had. An entirely comic booky art style for the HUD and the main menu didn't fit Asylum or City. And that's because those games weren't designed with an entirely comic book art style. They were designed with a hybrid comic book and realistic art style. That's why the change in the user interface from Asylum to City just doesn't feel as jarring as the change in the overall art from City to Night. Anyway, I also believe that some of the art changes for certain characters ends up taking away from the experience as well. In Night, Black Mask has his look changed from how he appeared in City into a new style that makes him look more similar to how he was depicted in Origins. The reason why this is a problem is because Black Mask's bio in City has already established that his mask was merged with his face. It's not supposed to be some random Black Mask a guy's wearing, like what we see in Origins. It's supposed to literally be stuck onto his face. 
and that's what we see in City. However, when we see Black Mask at night, his mask clearly isn't merged with his face. His mask just looks like a regular mask that he's wearing. He looks more like the Black Mask we saw in Origins, rather than the Black Mask we saw in City. However, Origins had already created a continuity error with Black Mask's backstory, so I don't know why Knight's narrative seems to be supporting that continuity error. I think Rocksteady should have just decided to let Origins become non-canon. Having it become canon just created so many continuity errors in the Batman Arkham series. Another art error is Batman's parents' corpse after they're killed. This is what they look like in Asylum, and this is what they look like in Origins. See the difference? They're even wearing different clothes in Origins, and they aren't even in the same position. To be fair, Knight also had Batman's parents depicted differently. They look slightly different, and Batman's mom is wearing a different dress. However, at least their corpses are in the same position as seen in Asylum and City. I know this may sound a bit nitpicky, but I think it's important to acknowledge the role that art has to play in creating continuity, especially in a series with several different incarnations like Batman. When I see Batman's parents look like this in the first game, and then I see them look like this in the sequel, it makes me wonder if I'm still in the same world as the previous game. The last character I'd like to talk about is the Riddler. I don't really like this new art style that he has in Night. Riddler has to be this obsessive nerdy guy, and I think Asylum City and even Origins did a good job of illustrating him as such. However, in Night, he looks like a dirty car mechanic, which is quite ironic considering that the Batmobile was introduced in this game. I think Rocksteady wanted this new style because they wanted Riddler to look like an inventor who had worked tirelessly for hours creating an army of robots. However, I don't really agree with this interpretation of Riddler's character. The Riddler of the Batman Arkham games always just seemed like a puzzle solver to me. He never seemed to be the same kind of genius that Batman or Mr. Freeze was. He never seemed like an inventor to me. So the direction they took with this character in Night just seems to be a very strange decision to me. I'd also like to talk about button mapping and how it has evolved over the course of the Batman Arkham series. I think this is a subject that isn't talked about enough in role-playing games. It doesn't matter that much for the PC version as the button mapping can be entirely customized, but for the console version, how the buttons are mapped can really make a difference to the gaming experience, especially in a role-playing game. For a broad role-playing game like Bloodborne, I don't think the button mapping matters too much, but for a very specific role-playing game like the Batman Arkham series, I think it does. The control scheme needs to feel intuitive and fluid, it just needs to feel so right that you feel like you are the character rather than someone who's just controlling the character. There's no fixed way to go about doing this, but most of the time I think this task can be accomplished by thinking logically about how the game works and how the game is played. We're controlling Batman, so we should feel like we're the Batman by an intuitive control scheme. For the most part, the control scheme for both the PS3 and Xbox 360 controllers gets this right. The left stick is near the directional buttons, and that helps us to remember that it's the stick which is responsible for movement. Our right thumb is going to be resting on the right stick for most of the game, so it makes sense for the action button to be the PS3's X button and Xbox 360's A button, because they're the closest to the right stick. The reason for this is because the action button is used for a variety of tasks from opening doors to evading attacks, so it makes sense for it to be located as close as possible to our free thumb which is resting on the right stick. Since the PS3 and Xbox 360's controllers are very similar, most of the button mapping in the Arkham series has been almost identical. The only notable difference is the button mapping of the item usage when the back buttons are involved. For example, for the PS3, the top back buttons were used to aim and use items, while for the Xbox 360, the bottom back buttons were used for these tasks. I think most of these differences are a result of the bottom back buttons on the Xbox 360 controller being longer and taking up more space. 
having an Xbox player use the top back buttons just wouldn't be as comfortable. There is one difference in the button mapping in which I think the Xbox 360 has traditionally done better than the PS3 in the button to activate detective mode. In the Xbox 360, to activate detective mode, you have to press the top left back button, while for the PS3, you have to press the bottom left back button. It's obvious that when detective mode is activated, something triggers at the top of Fat Man's suit, as his eyes are located at the top of his suit. That's why it just feels logical for the top button to be the button to activate detective mode. It just feels really intuitive. However, it feels strange to have to click a bottom button to activate detective mode in the PS3 version of the game. This may seem like a minor issue, but after it adds up after the course of the entire game, I think it can really make a difference to the experience. However, Knight fixes this issue by remapping the buttons for the detective mode. Instead of using the back buttons, now the PlayStation player has to double tap the triangle button to activate detective mode. This feels more intuitive because the triangle button is located at the top of the controller, so pressing it to activate detective mode does feel right. I'm not sure if this change was an intentional move on Rocksteady's part. It looks like they may have decided to remap the buttons because they were going to reassign the back buttons in order to control the Batmobile. Either way, it works and it does add to the experience. Now, I'm just going to give my thoughts on some aspects of the level design in the Batman Arkham games that I couldn't fit into any other sections of this video. It's notable that the Batman Arkham games have no manual save option. They only use autosaves. I think this is because the Batman Arkham games are designed to be very specific role-playing games. There's a reason why the taglines of the games is Be the Batman. They really want to make you feel like the Batman and they want to make sure that you're always in the moment whenever you go through a specific scene that's really supposed to make Batman's character resonate with you. A good example of this are the Scarecrow scenes in Asylum. They're powerful when we experience them all at once without any interruptions. Suppose if we had manual save and we saved the game during the middle of a Scarecrow psychological scene, and then we went out and came back the next day and continued off from where we left off. I don't think the Scarecrow scenes would have been as powerful if we did that. It's true that the autosave feature can be a bit of a hassle, especially for those of us with big commitments, but I really think it can make a difference in a very specific role-playing game. The manual save feature is more suited to a broader role-playing game like Dragon Age. Now I'd like to address the issue of padding. The Batman Arkham games are mostly very well paced and very well structured. I think Asylum and City are the entries which best achieve this. Unfortunately, Origins and Night have a few issues. I decided to do a statistical analysis on how many of each game element there were in each Batman Arkham games. I know this can be a bit subjective because certain parts of the game combine more than one element together, so it's possible I may have miscounted. Just take this as a rough approximation. As you can see, Origins looks pretty padded. The thing about Origins is that it just has too much stuff. Unlike Asylum and City that tried to make each element of the game stand out, Origins just tries to throw in as much stuff as possible. It focuses on quantity over quality, so we end up with a game that's a lot longer than it needs to be. I mean, we have more free flow combat sequences in Origins than in Night, despite the fact that Night is designed to be at least as twice as big as Origins. We're also running through halls more in Origins than we are in Asylum, despite the fact that Asylum is the game which is supposed to take in an enclosed environment and Origins is supposed to have a more open world setting. We also have a ridiculous amount of cryptographic secret sir hacking instances in Origins. The cutscenes are also a problem. There is a massive jump in the number of cutscenes from City to Origins, despite the games being roughly similar in size. However, I think this is a sin that even Knight commits. Knight has about double the number of cutscenes in Origins. I understand that it's supposed to be bigger, but I think that over a hundred cutscenes is way too much, especially considering the fact that Asylum and City use cutscenes conservatively. 
I think the reason why Rocksteady included so many cutscenes in Night was because next-gen technology allowed them to finally achieve a seamless transition from gameplay to cinematics. I think Rocksteady might have wanted to show off this feature, and unfortunately I think they went overboard with it. Another thing that changed with each entry in the Batman Arkham game series was the need for Batman to find alternate pathways to where he was going. There were several instances in Asylum where Batman found the door was locked and he had to find another way to get past the locked door. I like this because I think an important part about being Batman is his ability to find a way into any place without using gadgets all the time. Unfortunately, this happened less and less in later games. What's worse is that the alternate entry scenes became less engaging in later games because instead of finding the path yourself, Batman just told you where the alternate entry was. I think the reason for this change is because the Batman Arkham games became more open world as the series went on. It's easy to get completely lost in an open world looking for one tiny little event that can help you get into a building. However, I think having Batman tell the player where the alternate entry is, is just too much of a concession, as it takes away all the thinking that the player would have to do. Instead, Batman could have just given the player some clues about what kind of alternate pathway they need to look for. That way, the player will be given the opportunity to think and narrow down the possibilities. For example, the entry into Cionis' steel mill in City could have been done with this method. Instead of Batman saying he could enter Sionis' steel mill through the chimney, he could have just said something like, I need to think about where things are removed from a steel mill. From that clue, the player has to deduce that the chimney is their entry way into the steel mill. Where Batman gets his information from also changed as the Batman Arkham series progressed. In Asylum, Batman got most of his information from doctors or security guards. He got it from them after rescuing them. However, with each entry, the good guys are less in the know about what the villains are doing. So Batman has to get more and more of his information from enemy thugs after beating them up. I'm not sure how to describe it, but this just doesn't feel as fulfilling as when Batman saves an innocent hostage and is then rewarded by gaining information on the supervillains' plan from them. When I save a hostage and all they can say is thanks, I don't feel as fulfilled when playing as Batman. It's just not as fulfilling to get all the intel from the thugs. I think the reason for this is because gaining intel from the good guys makes it feel like that they actually are people who live in this world. I mean, it's a bit far-fetched that the only ones who can give me any decent information about Scarecrow's plans are the bad guys. A plan like this must have taken ages to organize. What were all the good guys doing during then? I think it's important in a superhero game to make the place you're trying to save feel like something that good people can or have used. It really adds meaning to what you're doing as a superhero. A big difference in the Batman Arkham games in comparison to games like The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is that the Batman Arkham games don't have a fully populated world where there are random people to save. I don't think it was a bad decision to not introduce civilians in Gotham, not only because it'll make more difficult for Batman to use the Batmobile without running over innocents, but also because Batman stories usually aren't about saving normal people. Since there aren't many innocent people in Batman Arkham games, Rocksteady has to find other ways to make the world feel alive. I think what they did in Asylum with the civilians giving Batman intel was great and I would have liked to see more of it in later games. I'd also like to touch upon the use of environmental puzzles in the Batman Arkham series. There's something that I think that the Batman Arkham games just don't do enough. Sure, there are puzzles, but they mostly make use of Batman's gadgets and not enough of the environment. One thing I think Origins did really well was make use of environmental puzzles. It's true that most of these were just opening the door puzzles, but that's a shortcoming that many games share. I'd also like to add that something I think the Batman Arkham games did really well was evolving Predator Mode over the course of the series. Predator Mode is the best evolved gameplay element, even better than free flow combat. Each game added something new to Predator Mode. City introduced hostages in Predator Mode. The thugs could start using hostages as human shields against Batman. When that happened, Batman was forbidden from using some of his gadgets against the thug because he might hit the hostage. So instead, Batman had to sneak up behind the thug to take him out. 
If the thug saw Batman, then the thug shot the hostage and Batman failed the challenge. In Origins, Warner Brothers introduced thugs armed with detective mode jammers, and these uh, jammers had to be disabled by disruptors before Batman could use detective mode. In Night, Rocksteady introduced drones that could be hacked to death, attacking thugs. The voice synthesizer could also be used to lure thugs into traps. This is how you effectively evolve a gameplay element over the course of a series. When it comes to the future of the Batman games, it looks like Telltale will be handling them rather than a regular AAA game studio. Telltale's games are really different from other mainstream games, but I still think that there are things with which they can take away from the Batman Arkham games. First, the setting can make a difference. A lot of effort needs to be put in to make the setting feel unique. It has to be diverse. It really helps if the setting looks like something we haven't really seen in a video game yet. Although Telltale won't be able to create a fully realized world due to the limitations of their game design, I do think they can deliver a small scale but compelling world. I really like what they did with Fable Town in The Wolf Among Us. I can actually see Fable Town as Gotham. I really hope that they bring this kind of style to the Gotham in their Batman game. The main difference between Telltale and Rocksteady's Batman is obviously going to be the gameplay. When I think of a Telltale version of Batman, I think of those 10 minute openings in Asylum and City stretched out for 2 hours. Although those openings were compelling, I'm not sure if they would work with a 2 hour format. I think the novelty will wear off unless Telltale finds another way to keep it there. Anyway, due to the limitations of their interactivity, I'd like to see Telltale focus on two things to make their Batman game stand out. Psychological scenes and detective work. As I said earlier, gameplay in psychological scenes has to be simple. The focus of the psychological scene should be on the atmosphere and the environment rather than complex gameplay mechanics. This will fit in really well with Telltale's quick time event system, which is a simplistic gameplay mechanic. I also think Telltale should be able to do a fine job with the detective work if they really put their mind into it. As stated previously, I think the best detective work is one where the player is required to use their brains and there's a branching path for them to take based on how well they did their detective work. Telltale's games are famous for their branching narrative, so if Telltale can write a great mystery, then I think they can create one of the best Batman detective games ever. That's what I'd like to see Telltale's dialogue trees to focus on. I don't think they should really be about character relationships as much as they are about mystery. The reason for this is because Batman and Bruce Wayne are pretty stoic characters. I mean, there's not much diversity to the decisions they make. You can't really expect wildly different decisions from them, like you can from Big B or Lee Everett. However, Telltale's teaser seems to suggest we'll be getting a fair bit of Bruce Wayne as well as Batman in their game. Despite that, I hope the focus is more on the mystery, rather than Wade and Batman's relationships with other characters. Another thing I'd like to see Telltale do is write a nuanced Batman story. Not every aspect of the narrative should be clear to the player unless they really dig in and put the clues together. Rocksteady did this in Asylum with the Joker's plan, but they didn't do it again. I don't think Telltale has ever written a story with that level of nuance before, but I'd like to see them try. Anyway, these are by no means be-all, end-all suggestions for Telltale. They're just what I think Telltale can learn from the Batman Arkham games. It's obvious that Telltale won't be able to do things like dual play or the Batmobile, but I still think there are things that they can learn and take away from the Batman Arkham games. Telltale doesn't necessarily even need to follow these suggestions if they can think of something better. Remember guys, these are all just my opinions. Anyway, thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, then please help my channel grow by sharing this video with as many people as you can. Link it on forums, subreddits, and whatever else you can find. The next episode of Game Narrative Design will be on Metal Gear Solid 5 and the rest of the Metal Gear series. I hope you'll join me next time. Have a great day.